remember in the 80s like boy george people question whether or not he was gay it's like well duh and then like frankie goes to hollywood that song relax i, I remember the Dude, song i don't remember what they look like relax oh, don't I, do, do it when do i go do it whatever <laughs> it's a song about jizzing Oh. Right? <laughs> See, you changes. don't even My know. My whole world is just shifted now. <laughs> right. I played that at bar right. mitzvahs <laughs> when I used to DJ bar mitzvahs. <laughs> it's about shooting cum ropes with dudes. <laughs> like, if it's the gayest song. God, this is a good song, dude. This Charming Man by the Smiths from their 1984 self-titled debut. It's also number 473 out of 500 on the 500 with Josh Adam Myers. Hi, everyone. It's me, Commander in Fleece, the King of Fleece, the head of the USS Fleece. I love each and every member of the Fleece Army, so thank you guys for tuning in. To the only podcast where we go through Rolling Stone Magazine's list of the top 500 albums from Five Honey all the way down to Numero Uno. And we are making our way through the list. We're making it through the list. Final air date of our last show is May 31st, 2028. It's a long time from now, but who gives a fuck? So pay for your Spotify's so you can fucking listen to each one of these records and follow along. Thank you to everybody that's doing the Instagram stories. Uh, Keep doing it, man. This is my thing. So every episode, I'm going to ask you guys, take a screenshot of how you're listening to the 500 and tag me at Josh Adam Myers and then put a hashtag, the 500 podcast. Give me a 24-hour ad on your social media. Trying to get the word out. I mean it, people. Help me out. All you got to do. 24 hours on your Instagram stories. Give me that time. Also, the only thing I got to promote right now, I've got a goddamn comedy jam May 13th at the Roxy. I've got Bill Burr, Jeff Ross, Maz Jabrani, Jackie Tone from Glow, and Joe Sib, former 500. Actually, one, two, three. Three of the people that are on that show have done the 500 and fucking killed it so if you want to get tickets go to the roxy's website it's going to be insane we're going to have a great time uh come to the show today in music for may 8th in 2001 the road manager for insane clown posse is arrested at an omaha show for attacking an eminem fan for tossing eminem candies on stage to taunt insane clown posse about their detroit rival I had no idea they had beef. Eminem had a beef with a lot of people, but I didn't know Insane Clown Posse made it in there. Not even on the same level. But dude, do I respect Insane Clown Posse for what they do? They created a whole genre of music that most people don't know, but it's big enough to support like a cruise and a festival every year, the Gathering of the Juggalos. If people are out there and they feel lost, there's a group out there for you that you can build a family with. So find it. You know what I mean? If it's insane clown posse being a fucking juggalo, do it. If it makes you a better person, it makes you feel worthy of yourself. My guest this week is Christina P. You guys know her from the, I don't know if you say the first, but your mom's house podcast, which she hosts alongside with her husband, Tom Segura, and her Netflix hour, Mother Inferior, also her more recent Netflix half hour, The Degenerates. Christina is one of my favorite comedians. I think she's one of my favorite people, too. I I, I just enjoy being around her. She's so funny, and she has such a funny zest for life. To find out she used to be goth when she has this really, like, positive energy, it just blows my mind. Very interesting guest. And when you have an interesting guest, you got to have an interesting album. To find out about this album, you got to go to a place called Manchester. Manchester is a major industrial city in northwest England. It's a tough place, man. 
especially in the early 80s when Margaret Thatcher's conservative party ran England with an iron fist. And it was here that one of the most influential bands of the 80s was born. Ten years earlier, glam rock had made fluid sexuality and androgyny permissible. By the early 80s, questionable sexuality and flamboyancy were not in short supply, but there was something new on the horizon. The Smiths formed in Manchester in 1982, anchored by the powerfully solid rhythm section of Andy Rourke on bass and Mike Joyce on drums. Vocalist and lyricist Stephen Patrick Morrissey, who would forever after be known only by his last name, had his roots firmly in the British tradition of dandified, intellectual, fiercely literate humorists like Oscar Wilde and Noel Coward. However, Morrissey offered the pop world something new, an asexual sex symbol who is lovably unlovable. While often standing in the tall shadow of Morrissey, not nearly enough is said about the Smiths guitarist and main music composer, Johnny Marr. His playing and writing were so accomplished and influential that it's easy to forget that Johnny was 19 when he started the band with Morrissey, Rourke, and Joyce, and only 20 when he recorded this album. Their self-titled album established their iconic sound, tone, and style. And although they were only together for about five years and only released four studio albums, the Smiths' impact on modern alternative music is immense. It's a big record, guys. And I don't know if you guys feel the same way that I did. Took me a while to get it. But when I did, it was in me. Don't forget to listen to the end of the podcast where we spotlight a new artist that was directly influenced by the Smiths. Also, rate, review, and most importantly, everybody, subscribe to the 500. Follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media. Guys, I'm close to 10,000. I want to break 10,000 in the next month, so follow me. Email the podcast at 500podcast at gmail.com. And for all things 500, go to our website, the500podcast.com. Well, nothing left to do but say, here we go, with number 473 out of 500, with the Smiths, the Smiths. Christina P. Christina Bajitsky. Oh, Christina Bajitsky. We'll around the fountain. Get ready when we find out. Wait till I tell you. Wait till I tell you what that shit means. I don't know what it. It's well. You, can I tell you something? Please. I'm so excited to finally because I've been doing like autopsies of all the shit that I liked as a teenager because there was no internet in the 90s. So you just kind of speculated what people's lives were like, what they were talking about, oh, what yeah. everything was. You've no idea. And now you can just Google it. And I just haven't. So Every, I'm fascinated. Everything is there. Hence why I'm doing this. I love it. Uh, it's and, exciting. And, and, it's, and it's, it's very exciting. Yeah. But tell me about, uh, you know, when was the first time you heard the Smiths? Oh, my God. <sighs> <sighs> well, first, let me preface this by saying. Please. The Smiths, to me, represent growing up in the Valley. And it's like, you know, Brody, everyone knows Brody Stevens. Yeah, the late, the late, great Brody. We grew up in the same neighborhood. And I, yeah, in the same even apartment building, except a few years apart. And I grew up with a group of goth kids. Like, the Valley was, it was fucking misery. And I think when Brody made it cool... It was like, oh yeah, like you, you he wanted made you it. proud yeah, to be to, from the valley. Yeah, did you know him growing up? No, no. not until in comic because he was a little older than me. Sure. He was older, so I don't know. But the first time I heard the Smiths, I was at a club called Maryland's. It was an underage nightclub in Pasadena. On a Friday night, they had like goth alt night, 
And it was the song, There is a Light That Never Goes Out, right? There is a light and it never goes out. And I'm like, this is fucking great. Because it was, uh, you know, you're just, I was so fucking miserable. How old are you? You're this is like 15. 15? Oh, 15. That's, that's, you don't know what's going on. Your no. body's changing. You hate high school. Your parents are Everything. dicks. Everything. Uh, Everything is terrible. And so you're going to this club. Were you were you yeah. like a rebellious kid? And yes. This, basic, this music made you be rebellious? Let me tell you. I, I You know when people are like, I like all kinds of music. That is not me. I do not like all kinds of fucking music. Yeah. Okay? All due respect to everybody. Like, I don't, I don't like fucking country. I don't like heavy metal. Sorry. I know you're wearing a Motley Crue shirt. They're not really heavy metal. What are they're, they? They're like, like butt rock? They're, they're, they're rock. They're just rock. I mean, there's heavy metal that's like Pantera, you know, okay. like the real death metal shit. And that's then there's scary. like, yeah, that's scary. And then there's like this. That's like, you know, <laughs> girls, girls, girls. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, east side of do by my ski bud. That's like, that's fun, you know? And, yeah. And, and also. That's I, true. That is fun. It's and silly. Al- very fun. And also, yeah. the, I was the same thing with I don't like country. And no. then I started doing this. And now I've realized I don't like new country. No. I like the old. I think you would okay. love the old shit. I think you're right. Like, is Johnny Cash country? Johnny Cash I is like country. That. Loretta Lynn I just I like did that. Okay. and and she's the most like bitching girl I've ever seen. She she like you know would fight her husband and write these songs about how much of an asshole he was to like she was like Cardi B before Cardi B. Okay. And in the country version, which so it's <laughs> so I think there's the idea I get right. what you're saying because when you're younger, especially when you're 15, like you you're so set in your ways of the yes. music that you listen to. And well, so and there's were, a there's a theory that when you're 15, that's when you lock in. Yes, and that's when I you that. get your taste and now forever. But sorry, what were you going to say? I interrupted you. No, I mean, it's you're 100 percent. I mean, when when I was well, when I was 15, it was it was grunge music. But there was still the remnants right. of of like because I had I had heavy metal when I was a kid. Then I had <laughs> hip hop when I was in sixth grade. Right. I became I was like, no more. No more uh, Motley Crue. It's all public enemy. And then I remember I like got my rid husband of, loved public enemy. Great band. Great band, but the I mean, best, but yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't think that you could listen to both types of music. Right. So I was like, no. So I was like, all right, I'm a, I'm a heavy metal, heavy metal now to hip hop. And then from hip hop, it became grunge. And then in high school, I started discovering back with hip hop and like Tribe Called Quest and all the other stuff. Yeah. But you were just God. <laughs> well, here's the thing. When I was sick, I, I listened, I grew up listening to Michael Jackson and pop and Cindy Lauper and all that shit. And then when I was six years old, in the back seat of my dad's car, I heard Rock the Casbah by the Shabby, car. Yes. don't like it. Bang. Bang. Rock, rock the, the Casbah. Casbah. Rock the Casbah. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know who the sheriff is. I don't know what this shit's about. <laughs> but I'm going to get it. I'm going to put a fucking brick through this. Like I I was like, I know I'm, I like alternative music. And yeah. then back then, growing up in the 80s and 90s, there was such a thing as alternative. So I guess you could say I, I identify as like an alt girl from the, the day. Dark, I like punk and new wave. So how did and the this, Smiths, how, so this, yeah, tell me so the Smiths. Smiths come into play around 15. And I meet my 15-year-old boyfriend at this club, Maryland's. And he's really into the Smiths, right? He's cool. He's, he's got. He's. Got, I'm just gonna imagine. Oh, well, he's got to be the coolest. He's the fucking coolest. He's the Dark Lord. He's the Dark Lord, <laughs> yeah, dude. Dude, he's got like the black trench coat, the black outfit. He's got like hair covering one eye, the bang. Yeah. And he's, the Columbine shooter. He yeah, like totally. The Columbine like, shooter. So okay. fucking hot, like Robert Smith hair. <laughs> yeah. And all the goth girls liked him, so he was like the hot goth guy. Okay. And he's fucking into me. Fuck and I was yeah. like, bro, what? So we exchange phone numbers. That's what you used to do back in the 90s. And I call his answering machine and everybody's like, dude, he likes you. This guy likes you. And on his answering machine is that song, 15, oh, um, the f- 15, 15 minutes with you. He's like, hey, this is dark yeah. matter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm in a really, yeah. really, I'm in the sunken place. Yeah. So, totally uh, in the sunken place. Don't leave a message because I'll never listen to <laughs> totally, it. <laughs> totally in the sunken place. I just want to love it. Totally. And, and then from that moment on, I was like, this is great. Like, what is this? Who is this? Because I think Morrissey, the first time I heard it, I don't think, I don't know. Do you automatically love it? No. You're kind of like, this guy's voice is weird. Yes. He's kind of an asshole. Yes. Like, he's a narcissist. Keep going because you're saying everything <laughs> that I felt for the longest time until literally two days ago <laughs> well yeah because he's not pleasant and he's not a people pleaser and 
But if, to a teenage girl, that's really powerful and really like, oh, you can be an asshole, but you got to be stylish about it. Which he was. You better fucking be smart and you better back it up with talent and be hot as fuck. And he was and he was all these things. You think he's hot as fuck? I think he's hot. I think. And here's the thing, too, is listening to this album again as an adult because I haven't yeah. listened to it forever. I was like, this is like the gayest album I didn't realize how fucking gay. When I saw you last night, I mean, <laughs> it it's to go through a deep dive on the lyrics of this album <laughs> oh and to God. read it and and just wait. I mean, yeah. like I had no idea. Like reel around the fountain. <laughs> the title of that uh, is yeah. that's a term in the gay community when you run your tongue around the tip of someone's penis what? until they ejaculate. I didn't know that. Yep. And then the it, there. This is. <laughs> I went deep into this. Garrett, you tell me more. I'm done. I want to fuck a man now. That's <laughs> what I know. I'm extremely horny and depressed at the same yeah. time. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so what you said was so true. I My experience with the Smiths was, I remember I was in high school and I had these two friends, Marissa and Courtney Kelly. They were the hip, alt, like, I want to call them indie rock chicks. I, I went to the 930 Club with them the first time. And they What's were the like 930 Club. 930 is Club is a club in DC. No, no, no. It's oh. it's one of the best rock clubs in the world. It's oh. it's it's hands down, you know. I mean, I saw everybody from Old Dirty Bastard there to Radiohead and Alanis Morissette to I saw everybody. Six hundred seater in DC. Uh, and I saw like they took me to my first like real hip concert, which was Orange Nine Millimeter and Corn, and it was like it was like it was like leaving, not going with like a like a parent and that kind of a concert. Like being cool, being cool. And yeah. I remember one night they were like, "Hey, we're going to see Morrissey. Do you want to come?" And oh. I was like, "No, I'm good." I was like, "I think I had something to do." And the next day at school, they were like, they were like, we touched him. I can't believe we touched him. And I yeah. was like, all right, well, this let me check out this guy's music. And I listened to it. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is this shit? I was like, this isn't Scott Weiland. I was like, time yeah. to take her home. That's, that's a musician. Right. Scott Weiland from Plush or from fucking Stone Temple Pilots. Right. So I, I, never, I never thought he was, like, I never got it. Yeah. I, I understood why people got it, but I just never did. And then as I've gotten older, um, and it's gotten to like I've met like we, you know, Adam Egit from the store. Yeah, and Adam and I love the Smiths all day, dude. Such yeah. a huge fan, yeah. and I was always wondering why. Because every time I listen to it, I'm like, this just sounds like whiny, depressing. <laughs> you know, I'm not adding the the homosexual stuff because I never, I didn't realize it was so overtly homoerotic until dude. I read the lyrics. Well, let me tell you because. Like, as I said before, no internet, you're 15 years old, and you discover that there's a person out there who's more depressed than you, and who's pretty smart, because there's some references that I don't understand what this guy's talking about, yeah. but it turned me on to literature, to like Oscar Wilde, to all this stuff, but yeah. that as a teenager, you're like, wow, there's some deep shit, but the point being, the rumor was, growing up, because that's where you got your info, was from your homies, right, your goth homies, it wasn't that Morrissey was gay. Morrissey was not gay. The official party line was Morrissey is asexual. 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 Yes. And I believe that's probably what he had to tell people back then to keep his female fan base. Or I don't know. I don't know why. Yeah, it's the, it's the, if it's true. It's the Ricky or, Martin, George Michael. It's the whole right. George Michael effect. We all is fucking that, knew he was we, gay. Every, well, we all knew Ricky fuck. Martin was gay. George yeah. Michael. Come on. How do we not know? But, but George Michael, here's the thing, is yeah. the Freedom 90 video has True. some of the most beautiful women in the world half naked. Right. And, and he still, even though he had that weird gay guy stubble <laughs> with the weird gay guy earring <laughs> and the weird gay guy pompadour, and yeah. you can look back at the other stuff when he did with Wham. Even when he did Wham. Faith. Even Wham. when he did Faith. I remember my babysitter was like, <laughs> she was like, he's so sexy. Like, he is just, oh, my God. <laughs> like I've never seen a man wear short shorts like that. <laughs> the way that he does that. But remember in the 80s like Boy George, people question whether or not he was gay. It's like, well, duh. And then like Frankie goes to Hollywood, that song Relax. I, I remember the Dude, song. I don't remember what they look like. Relax. Oh, don't I, do, do it. it. When do I go do it? Whatever. <laughs> it's a song about jizzing. Oh. Right? <laughs> See, changes. you don't even My know. My whole world is just shifted now. <laughs> right. I played that at bar right. mitzvahs <laughs> when I used to DJ bar mitzvahs. <laughs> it's about shooting cum ropes with dudes. <laughs> like, it's the gayest song. But so, so with Morrissey, like, because we saw each other at the store last night, and yeah. you were like, Jesus, were you a lesbian? Like, were you struggling? I'm like, no, actually, I was really, really a depressed teenage girl yeah. listening to what apparently is a really, really depressed young gay man 
probably finding his way out. Sure, no, completely. You know? okay, there's a lot of confusion, I think, in this album. So let's, oh my god! So let's let's dive in to the album. Our album is number four seventy three out of five hundred. It's the debut self titled studio album by The Smiths, released on February 20th, 1984. Damn. Produced by John Porter, recorded in London, and of course, Manchester, because he won't shut up about uh, it. Oh, Manchester. So, 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 I, you, you, so you identified it with a lot of it. You, so Wait, you Johnny identi- Marr's on this album. Johnny Marr is on the album. Yeah. And he's 19 when they wrote this album. And that's bananas. Bananas, because the guitars are some of the best part of it. So now that we're looking back, yeah. And you listened to the record a long time ago and it had all this meeting, you know, now how are you, how are you digesting it? Oh my God. I'm having like, I had to talk to my therapist about it today. <laughs> 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 Cause I listened to the album to prepare and I, and I got so depressed. I think we, we were even texting yesterday and I was like, I don't know if I can do this one. You're like, can I do the clash London <laughs> calling? And I'm like, that's in nine years. <laughs> can I do London calling? That's in nine years. I need you now, <laughs> Christina. I need you now. <laughs> <laughs> trying to build these oh, numbers. God, I'm trying. So, so I felt so depressed, and I, and it actually made me really sad to think about how depressed I must have been as a teenage girl. Were you very depressed back then? Exceedingly. Is so. that why you become goth? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was just like you like the style, you like the Maybe. music, and you identify. You meet other cool people. Like some people get brought into the fold. Other people create True. it where they're like, no, I'm just dark, and then you want to hang out with the dark that's kid it. because he's dark. So that's what you were? That's what I was. I finally found a tribe, much like in comedy, where you're like, oh, these people are weirdos like me. This is great. Yeah. And I was, um, I was, yeah, so listening to it now, I'm like, man, if my kid was listening to this shit in the dark the way I was... <laughs> <laughs> there would be a conversation. There would be some therapy. You know so, what I mean? So so what did you tell your therapist? So fucking bums me out. I was like, I feel I feel sad like I did as a teenager. Like I'm having like all these flashbacks to being, um, you know, 15 and like just sad all the time and fucking hating being an adolescent. And, um, and then, you know, I'm a 42 year old mom now. And I'm like, some of these songs are great, by the way. Like I'll still rock out to this charming man. Yes. I'm fucking down for still ill. Like some of these are jams. It's a great record. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I did. I had my moment. <laughs> I think it was yesterday or the day before where I was, I was just like, I'm not getting this. I'm not, I just don't think it's for me. I was like, I get it, yeah. but I'm not getting it. And then I woke up in the morning and a charming man was yeah. just running through my head. It's a great and then song. I put it on and I started cooking breakfast and Lekka's walking around. I started dancing with the yeah. dog and I was like, and then that took me back to, I used to go to this indie rock party in Baltimore called Tax Low. And it was just all the kids that loved the post-punk, you know, but in like 2005 and they would play like Block Party and Franz Ferdinand. And I remember they used to put the Smiths on. I was like, God, I do remember this song. Oh, and so it, it started to, it clicked and listen, I'm not saying I'm a huge Smiths fan, but what I'm saying is I respect it oh, and I so get good. it. I get why people love this and I can imagine how Oof. heavy that was to be 15 oh hearing it. Because now I'm hearing it as an adult where I've worked my life out and I'm not as yes. depressed as I was so I can handle it. It brings me down a little bit, but it's not killing me. No. But uh, I, I respect what they're doing and I can see why it's on this list. And I'm, But I'm also excited to hear what other music they're going to do because this is their first record. Well, and um, and you also have the magic of Johnny Marr with Morrissey, yeah. which is huge. If you're a Morrissey fan, there's like this, there's a thing where there's like, is it the Smiths or Morrissey? You know, because some people really love it with Johnny Marr and when they split, it was like a big deal. And I think what's also really fascinating about Morrissey and the Smiths and all this is that the Latin community fucking loves Morrissey. Did is that you, true? Did you know that? Yeah. I, I feel like I've heard that, but I, I just don't know if that's true. Dude, it is fucking true. And it started in the 90s because I remember going to Morrissey shows and stuff. Yeah. And you would see like just droves of Latino dudes <laughs> in like pompadours in the outfit. And you're like, what is this? And we had George Perez on our show, Your Mom's House. And yeah. he was saying, he's like, oh no, it's truly... There's something romantic about Morrissey and there's the, it's about love and romance and they they just are drawn to him and the drama. That's and like beautiful. I totally get it. No, I, I totally do get, get it. it. He's so arrogant though. So that, arrogant. that part kind of now as an adult I'm like, wow, homie, look at you. Look at you, homie. Well, and it's all said in this record. Like when we get to a, a song down the road. So let's dive, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's dive go. into the record. Let's go. All right, let's so go. the song starts off with uh Reel Around the Fountain. 
like I said, is wow. about running your tongue around the tip of someone's penis until they ejaculate. Never knew it. I, nor did I. Uh, mm. This one took me a minute uh, before it clicked. But when it clicked, I started digging it. Peter, play uh, Morrissey's opening verse. It's time to tell the tale of how you took a child and you made him all. It's time to tell the tale of how you took a child and you So I always interpreted that just to mean it's like a loss of virginity. Yes. And it's his first gay, gay All right. experience. Is that so, what it's about? So it's, time to tell the t- so it's time the tale we're told of how you took a child and you made him old. So it's a pretty courageous, first of all, to put their longest song on the album as their opening track on their debut record. Also, this song hmm. was incredibly controversial. While the song took some heat when it came out because it was rumored to be about pedophilia. Right. The child part is alarming now. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Morrissey said that it's about, like you said, the loss of innocence, that until one has a physical commitment with another person, there's something childlike about their soul. Hmm. All right. So let me ask you, when did you feel like you lost your innocence? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you, you, we might not Met, metaphorical innocence, physical innocence. <laughs> However innocent. you want to take it, yeah. Wow, that's a deep question. Um, okay, I mean, I've always I been a dark know soul. Yeah. What you're thinking? <laughs> Tell me what's on your mind. Pure energy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that one? Is that that's not Duran? Right? It's, it's something. Good. I want to know. <laughs> yeah, super lame. Uh, uh, can I tell you? I know the exact moment that I became an adult. It's super weird. Yeah. I was I was 12 years old. I came home from junior high school. I was a latchkey kid. So was I. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Deep into the Cure, I started listening to the Cure. I was already wearing black. Seventh grade. <laughs> I come home. Mom's out. I'm alone in the house. I punch out the window. The um, not put the glass. The um, screen. Yeah. I take it out. I light a cigarette. We're on the second floor. I'm smoking a cigarette. And I have this realization that I am alone. And I say that to myself. I go, oh, wow, I'm alone. Like, I'm metaphorically alone in the world, and I am alone right now. And I just start crying uncontrollably. And I was like, oh, I I think I'm an adult now. Like, I think something's... I had this existential realization at 12 years old that we're alone in the world kind of thing. Did anything change for you after Every, that? Everything. Like just everything? Everything. What? So tell me how it changed. I was an adult. I was, I mean, look, I, my pa- family was cre- crazy. I raised myself in a lot of ways. And from that moment on, it was like, I had to get out of my house. I had to, you know, make friends on the outside. Yeah. I, I raised myself. And that's just, I, I just kind of assumed responsibility for myself. If, does that make sense? No, like, it makes perfect yeah, sense. Yeah, I'm like, I'm out. I'm out, dude. I'm, I'm going to get out of here the minute I can kind of thing. I don't even remember the time when I lost when my When did you, do you mean like, and sex? Well, all right. Sex is like sexually, 16. Se- no, but sexually, I, I had a lot of experiences where I used to go to this summer camp, Seneca Creek camp, <laughs> and I was the coolest kid there. I really was because I was I was I was uh, I was a medicated ADD, but but the <laughs> but the Ritalin they gave me made me so wild because it's speed and it didn't do what it was supposed to do. It just made me have more energy. Do you take that now? No, I don't take anything now. Yeah, I don't take anything. I'm boring. So I wish I still had it because I mean, there's 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 days that it's like Jesus Christ, yeah. man, just like a bump of Ritalin just to fucking Fuck. just to clean the house and take <laughs> leck out, but. The I remember I used to go to this camp and I remember at I think twelve I felt up a girl and made out with her and then the next year at Hello, thirteen I'm talking about like existential and you're like a felt of a girl no 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 but what? then but I'm talking Josh. then but the, the ex, uh, existential let me finish this and then we'll get to my <laughs> existential then I remember at thirteen I I had I got a blowjob at that <laughs> camp at thirteen. That's really young to get a BJ. And right? I think I think when it, it's too way too young. And I yeah. think I think when you're talking about being innocent, it's just like looking back at that stuff now, it, it kind of makes sense that as I think about the first girl I ever had sex with, I don't know her name. It was just some girl I met at Myrtle Beach when I went with my <laughs> friends down to Beach Week. Right. You know? And it's like like 
looking back, it's like, what do I wish I still had that innocence and maybe would have waited and found somebody special? Wait, how old yeah. is Myrtle? Myrtle Beach, when I lost my virginity, was 18. Yeah, so with that, right, but that was that's of age. I mean, that's... Uh, that's fine, but yeah. also, what we're talking about... But I, I, I feel as though sexual, to me, having sex with that, because I had sex with my, my first boyfriend, and we had been together for a whole year before we had done it, and yeah. it was special, and I was like... Oh, yeah, I'm ready for this. Like, it wasn't a big loss because it had been gradual and natural is what I'm trying to say. I mean, do you look back at your sexual experiences and wish that you would have done anything differently? No, I'm actually, yeah. of all the things I've fucked up in my life, I feel like I did that right. Yeah. Like I said, my first, like a lot of my firsts were with that, with my great boyfriend from high school who loved the Smiths yeah. and he was a sensitive, sweet guy. Oh, that's like, good. Yeah, no, it was ideal really. And to this day we're friends and he's got a family and I have a family and, and I just, I adore him. I still think he's Are great. You, do you, you keep in touch with him? Well, like cursory yeah. DM on Instagram once every year. Hey man, how's the kid? You know, remember like, when we nice. fucked to no. uh, <laughs> Friday? I'm in love. Remember we were? And then there was, yeah, I know. Uh, uh, but no, I mean, I do wait maybe a little, I could have been more promiscuous in college because I grew up in like the AIDS era where everybody was afraid of getting AIDS and I was terrified. Everybody was afraid. Yeah, I should have fucked around more, maybe. A lot of people that, that, that don't have those experiences always uh, regret that. So you, did you bang around a lot? Way too much. Oh, okay, and, so you're on and the And so end. you were asking me if I had a girlfriend. I'm at a point right now in my life where I want to meet somebody special and I want to get married because everything right. is going well. Like, I mean, like I have money coming in, my career is really taking off, and I'm so happy. And so now I've I've cut out the the random hookups because I don't want to give that energy away. Yeah. And I actually did hook up with a girl while I was in Austin and I immediately regretted it. Really? And I was just like, because I've done it. I've, I've had random sex before. It's great. But I want to have something more substantial. I want to right. I want to I want to make love. I know this is so cheesy. I want to make love and not just fuck. Not saying I don't want to fuck, but I want to fuck the person that I make love to. You got to listen to Smiths, bro. <laughs> you got to fucking find your Smiths. I want to have 15 minutes with you. <laughs> That's right. That's what the fuck well, I want. You got to get romantic like Morrissey here. Yeah. All right. Guitarist Johnny Moore came up with the Mar. song. Mar. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a new You just fan. offended all the fans <laughs> listening. Johnny Marr came up with the song's music by trying to remember how to play Jimmy Jones' 1959 R&B hit, Handyman, huh. which was later covered by James Taylor. Now, Morrissey was obsessed with the British kitchen sink drama movies, and in particular, A Taste of Honey, which is a by a British playwright. Let me see if I can get this right. Sheila Delaney. Hmm. It's from there that he lifted the line, I dreamt about you last night, and, <gasps> and I, fell I fell out of, out of bed twice. Yep, you Morrissey, <laughs> Morrissey has, sold, has said that wow. Delaney was at least 50% of the reason he became a writer. Wow. Who were you most influenced by before you developed your own voice? Comedically. However. Oh, so many people. I, you know, like Morrissey, I would say is huge just yeah. in terms of learning how to be, f to have an air of like artistry. Yeah. If you're going to be fucking depressed, be interesting about it. Sure. Be, be interesting. I think is what you learn. Oh my God. I love Bill Hicks a lot. I like the dark, the dark Lords, man. You know, Bill Hicks fucking, um, Bill Carlin. Hicks, Carlin. Yeah. I loved Roseanne growing up too. She was so great. So fucking amazing. She was so fucking funny, man. Love. I, I had I had her uh comedy album. I forget which one it was, but on the album she was like all done up and she was like laying on a couch and I had like her and uh I used to listen to her and Dice Clay like non <laughs> Dice was great. Dice for for a for a thirteen year old boy, yeah. that's the coolest comedy you've ever heard. Just that dirt all that dirty shit. Yeah. Um I didn't get into Bill Hicks until later. Oh, I think Bill Hicks bent my noodle the most. And Carlin. Yeah. I was like, dude, this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, and then Anthony Bourdain. I, I, I read a lot of his books. I, I liked him. I liked these darks. I liked Joe Strummer a lot, too. And and I liked Bauhaus. I liked Bau like how lyrical they were. I never listened to them. <gasps> I, I'm is sorry. Is there a Bauhaus album on this too? If there is, it's yours. Oh. But you've already got the Clash. I got, okay, got the Clash. I'm, London Calling. That's, that's huge. in nine years though. Fuck, I'm that's here. one of the top ten. All right. All right. Anyway, okay, go ahead. You've got everything now. Uh, second song on the record. I yeah. really like this song. Really? Very dark. 
Yeah. Very doff. The chorus is tight. Uh, Peter, uh, play the chorus. No, I've never had a job because I never wanted one. I see you smile, but I've never really heard you laugh. So who is rich and who is poor, I cannot say. So some sample lyrics from this. This is how dark this is. As merry as the days were long, I was right and you were wrong. Mm -hmm. You are your mother's only son and you're a desperate one. This is the darkest shit I've ever heard. But I don't want to love her. But I don't want to love her. I just want to be tied to the back of your car. God! What what do they say (laughs) is going on there? (laughs) So... This is a song about bitterness and yeah. comparing oneself to someone else. Mm. Like this is a, what I got from this is like Maz is talking to the people he thought Maz. he was better than in high school, right? Because uh, he's just everything. It's about you know about his job. It's he, he's, he's trying to tell them how much smarter he is. Uh, it could be about uh, this. This could be about a lover or maybe a figure of desire that didn't pan out. But in my opinion, this is like Morrissey's, like you were saying, all that shit at the beginning of how he's described as like he's more intellectual and he's more beautiful. And that's, I think, how he probably perceives himself. This is his fuck you song. <laughs> so is there anybody from that's your... That's accurate. I think so. Is there anybody from your past that you would single <laughs> out as your nemesis? Oh my gosh. Uh, my nemesis, dude. <laughs> How many times in your life do you get do you get a nemesis I know, question? Oh man, fuck. Is, this, is this Star Trek generation? <laughs> I didn't have a nemesis. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess there's a few high school bitches. Yeah, why? What did they do? Because the well, follow up, the follow up to this yeah. is: in whose faces would you most like to rub your success? <laughs> Oh my god, this is so fucking fucked up. Because yeah, here's great. The, this here's is the, the album. I'm just using the, the album. No, I hear you. I hear you. And and also, see, but here's the here's the greatest irony with Morrissey though, which he was always talking about being young and beautiful, and haha, I'm younger and beautiful, yeah, beautifuler, prettier than you, and I'm this like hot guy. Fuck you. I've got youth on my side. Yeah. But guess what, bitch? We all get old. Yes, we and do. you look at the Mazer now, and I'm not, no disrespect, like I haven't actually seen him in a while, so I don't know how he's held up. He's, he doesn't look bad. Okay. He looks like a guy that's probably in his 50s that, you know, is relatively stayed in shape, has too much sodium. It was a little bloated. little bloated, yeah. Yeah, because he had this song that's like, you silly old man. It's, it's called Get Off the Stage, you silly old man in your misguided trousers with your... What does he say? You're in your Fender guitar and you think you can arouse us. Like he's talking shit about rock stars who won't go away. Yeah. And it's like, well, you became that, bro. Yeah. OK, so here he is. There yeah, he he's is. held up. Yeah, he doesn't no, look he's bad. Held up. He doesn't look bad at all. But I mean, you could see that it's definitely he's I mean, listen, the guy hasn't had meat his whole life. <laughs> you know, he didn't <laughs> have sex true. until 2006. That's allegedly. That's allegedly. Right. Alleged. Is that real? No, probably not. I don't have anybody. I got to be honest. I think I did initially when I first got a little bit of success. It, it was like a double bird to everybody in high school who thought I was a loser or weirdo. And, you know, the cheerleaders that I imagined I had beef with, but I prob- they probably they, didn't they don't, fucking that's, care. That's just your ego. It's a, yeah, and, and you're you know? just completely creating everything. Yeah. And that's just and what, it's, what sucks is that. You know, that's just kids being kids. Yeah. That's literally just the cool kids hang out over here. And regardless if they they don't say shit to the goth kids, those goth (laughs) kids immediately think they're shitting on them because they're just sitting in their section with their friends. Yeah. That's what we create. It's silly. I mean, who do you, who would you give a big, you know? Man, probably uh, one of my strip club DJ uh, job <laughs> bosses, like one of the managers. Uh, but he actually passed away, so uh, <laughs> jokes no, so, on him. So jokes on him. Probably yeah. should have laid off that sodium. <laughs> um, no, you know what's funny is I was a I was popular because I was funny, and I used comedy as a defense mechanism because I was a smaller guy. You know, I played sports, but I wasn't good enough to be on any of the teams. So I, but I was just, I, you know, I was that, like Angelo Bowers, who as you say, there's the two types of people that become comics. There's the actual class clown and then the guy that made fun of the class clown. Uh-huh. And he was like, I'm the guy that made fun of the class clown. Well, I was friendly with everybody. 
because that's all I wanted was just to be accepted. And I didn't want people making fun of me. I didn't want them to know that, you know, my family was having problems and we were poor and, you know, it, it was, so I, I was just, as, it, as far as it came to in high school, um, it would be nobody from there. If I really could rub any of this in anybody's face, it would be my dad. <laughs> Right. Yeah, because he. That's and, good. And right, actually. Bef- right before he died, we, mm. we we had settled everything. It was very like I had started getting my life back together. Like I'd just gotten a, like a bank account again. I mean, it's 2010. I was I was in bad shape the first few years I moved out here, and so when it came to him getting sick, he he had an aneurysm in his heart, Ugh. and and we had a we had a month with him because they God. saved him in that surgery. So during that month, I remember I went to see him in Philadelphia where he was staying because that's where they, they went to my mom's uh, high school reunion. My parents lived in Maryland, but it happened in Pennsylvania. And I remember that week that I was there, my dad was just like, I'm really proud of you. Oh, wow. I really love you. You know, I'm sorry if I was hard on you. And he just, he got it all out. So there's not, it's not like the real big fuck you, but it's a mixture of like, I would bust his balls if he was alive. And I'd be like, I told you I was going to do this. And I told you I would do something with comedy and with music mm. because he was always like, how can you do both? That's impossible. You have to pick one. So it's not a fuck you, but it's, but it's kind of, a <laughs> you. you know what I mean? <laughs> that's a good Love one. Love you, dad. That's a good one. Miserable lie. Yeah. That's a good one. This, this is like two songs to me because, yes. because that's I agree. Perfect. Musically, it starts as a mid. T- it starts mid tempo, showcasing Johnny's signature jangly guitars, and then it raves up to uh-huh. a rockabilly tempo. Uh-huh. Once again, extremely dark. Peter, play forty eight <laughs> seconds in. This motherfucker is twisted. I, I it. look at yours, you, you laugh, laugh at, at mine. mine. Good God. And love is a miserable, miserable lie. lie. And you've destroyed my flower-like life, mm-hmm. not once, twice. Mm. This appears to describe a sexual relationship that didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Morrissey, like we said, lost his virginity, supposedly, at 13, and described it as not very good. Mm. Uh, some people say the song tells a story of a naive country boy corrupted by the lustful ways of a prostitute. And we get that because he mentions Wally Range in the song, which became a red light district in Manchester. Uh, as the song goes on, and mm-hmm. we were talking about the tale of two songs, when he starts going into yeah. that falsetto, as I it's like, I need advice! I need advice! Oh. I need advice. Oh. That's and he's doing that. That's scary <laughs> as fuck. He's saying, "I need advice." Peter, yeah. play a little bit of that. Over Mars, punky guitars Love hijacking it. the song. Now he keeps saying, "I need advice." Who always delivers to you the most sobering message in life? Oh my god, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. you. Come up with these. I got two writers. <laughs> I honestly, this is gonna sound really stupid. Howard Stern. Yeah. I fucking listen to Howard Stern every day. And I feel like he's the voice of reason. I feel like I agree with him on so many things. Does it have to be a real life person? Could be however you want to take it. Yeah. I can see that because, Howard. dude, it's like, you know, when, like, I remember being, like, being like, 12, 13 years old when I really got into Howard and it was just like he, for, but he formulated, he showed me yeah. that you can, that you can say whatever you want. Like you can really, yeah. you can put it out there. And if, as long as you own it, when you put it out there, it's not bad. Yeah. You know, and, and it's definitely, he's definitely a huge influence on me. I should actually add him in the list of comedic influences. Cause I think he formed me into the degenerate person that I am today. Cause I listened to him from the time I was 14 years old on too. And yeah. he's a huge part of my psyche. Him and my husband, obviously. I've got, my husband's fucking brilliant he's does, does does tom give you advice tom gives me great advice like business stuff life stuff he actually civilized me i always say that i was like this 
crazy dog when we met and he trained me to be like a, 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 a person. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, you meet somebody and they sure. kind of like take you under their wing and they're like, oh, no, no, no. This is how you act normal. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to fucking do it that way. Um, yeah, my husband's huge. All right. What it, about you? For what? Who's, who's Who taking gives me? you advice? Uh, Sickler. Yeah, he's great. Ryan's my Yoda. He's yeah. always been my Yoda. Um, he's the best. But Ryan's advice is always, man, you tell that person <laughs> to go fuck himself. That's why I don't work with them people no more. <laughs> Isn't he remind you of Red Fox? Oh, he is. He's, he's an the, old black man yeah. in, a, in, a, yes. in an old white man's body. 100%. Brian and now it's it's Bill. Burr is Burr has given oh, me great. some of the best advice and anytime I get frustrated or if I have a question about anything, he's always got a perspective because he struggled for so many years and so he knows how to play this game and he knows how to tell, help somebody that is at that point where they're like, I don't know what to do. It's like, should I do this? Should I do that? He's done it. Oh, yeah. So to get that advice, as far as, as life, though, it's it's sickler because he, Ryan is just, he's we, we best, have such right? a connection that, that I love him to death. So I love him, too. He's, he's one of my comedy brothers. Yeah, I wish I could for have been sure. a part of that group at the beginning to oh, see y'all. I know, but you're like, but like when, the, when you guys were the Latchkey Kids, and you were like, <laughs> it was you, Fulcheron, and Segura. Yeah. yeah, that just that's just such a good group of people. Oh, you're sweet. All right, in describing his strong feelings for this song in a Melody Maker interview from March 1984, Morrissey said, "I'm really ready to be burned at the stake in total <laughs> defi- de- defense of that record." Love him. Have you ever had to defend any of your jokes? Yeah. Yeah, but I fucking don't. Can I tell you, I saw the best thing on Instagram today. What's Marlon that? Wayans, there, he's some interview, and he was like, fuck you and your sensitive feelings and your fucking snowflake feelings. I'm going to do my job of being a comic and fuck you. And that's kind of how I feel. So have I been, have I offended people? Yeah. Have I gotten hateful tweets and people trying to get me to fucking defend myself? Yeah, but I won't do it. Yeah. I don't defend myself. Either you like it or you don't. When when did it ever become acceptable? You don't like what somebody says and you, you can engage them in a thing and now they have to apologize to you because you you Social feel media. some it's kind of way. Because now we have instant access to everybody. It's, it's absurdity. It is. It is absurdity and I will not do it. I won't fucking do it. Maybe. Have you done it yet? No, but I, well, as far as stand up, my stand up isn't well known, like to a point where, like, you've had an hour and the half hour, especially the degenerates, which is like supposed to be edgy shit. Yeah. So it's like the <laughs> idea of somebody getting mad, like Big J, I'm, I'm very yeah, close to yeah, Big J. And Big him. J was telling me, um, the weekend that that came out, we did a weekend together in Minnesota, and he was like, dude, I'm getting like real, like, hate mail from certain <laughs> people about a joke. And he's just like, it's like he he does he actually interacts with them, but in a way that he makes them look stupid. It's it's really smart how he does it. Like he's like you're the one that's actually like if he like if he ever does like a joke on stage. I remember I saw him do this in Minnesota. He said something about some Asian woman. He goes, you know, I bet you. He's like, do you have a, a tunnel built between your house and the Cheesecake Factory? Because you know he's like with the Vietnam War type shit. Right. And like the crowd, <laughs> like crowd, this crowd starts getting like upset. And he goes, if you guys. If you guys are upset by that, you're more racist than I am because that means you actually think that she might have that 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 uh you know that the Ho that, Chi Minh. The, the Ho Chi Minh trail <laughs> yeah. from from her house to the Cheesecake yeah. Factory yeah. and and he's right it's yeah. like he's just making a joke of ridiculousness yeah the stupid. idea that you're like you shouldn't say that why because she might actually like yeah, is that that's silly. what you're putting there. Well, same with Morrissey. Any, anything he says. I mean, what do you... Give me a fucking break. No, he's... He's talking he's, about banging dudes. Yeah, Come exactly. On, what do you care? Also, this song is about lies. Uh-huh. That's another thing. Uh-huh. What are the worst lies you've ever told? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. This is horrible. Is you do horrible? this to everybody? To everybody. Wanda Sykes. Was what right did, here, well, like, did she answer this fucking... Not this question. Which, this is the album that you chose. I Hers know. was Earth, Wind, and Fire, so it was a lot about like love Sex. and peace. Like, what is the most peaceful you've ever had, experienced you've ever <laughs> I had? I should have picked She's that like, one. Well, you'll live it, till you. <laughs> I should have picked that fucking record. Yeah, what am I doing picking the hard ones? God, not, this, this is, is my this life. This is you. This is you. I know. This is your... your I you've, know. Listen, you are, this, you are this beautiful ray of light that entertains so many people, <laughs> yeah. but you still got that dark... I do. center. Your dark I matter. Do. <laughs> 
You smoked clove cigarettes. I did. And you fucking wore, you know, shawls made of black. I and did. You, yeah. In, were, in the Wiccan. valley, in the valley summers, man. <laughs> I fucking represent, bro. In the valley summer. I did. I wore like witch boots and velvet cloaks and oh, I loved it. I'm trying to think. Okay, let me see. I've lied to my parents repeatedly. Yeah. I, you know, probably I dropped out of law school. I didn't tell anybody for a minute. That was a good one. Well, let me think. I try not to lie to my husband. I lie about little shit, like minuscule stuff. Yeah. Like, uh, well, there's little lies. Like, like, like nothing. But those are fine. Like, what am I even lying about? Yeah. Like, uh, hold on. Let me think. You tell me yours, and then I'll think of mine. I think. lied about the first girl I had sex with. I said it was Tammy Musser, and it wasn't. It wasn't <gasps> Tammy Musser. It was the no name. It was the no name girl. <laughs> like, Some no name bitch. Yeah, but but Tammy was Tammy was cool, so she didn't she didn't make a big deal about it. She just like I guess played around with it. But Tammy was also kind of a she was a little you know little little minx little minx. Yeah, thank mm. but thank you for giving me the word. <laughs> I was like in my head, I was like, what is what should I call her? No, it, I, dude, I don't know. I lied to my parents. We all lie to our parents, you know. Yeah, I lied. We all that's I, that's I, the I, that's the easy one. I'm trying to think of a biggie, like a biggie. Um. But I, you know, I guess I use my kids to get out of stuff sometimes. But even that's not really a fucking lie. No, that's they just do that's ruin just, your that's life. Just, you know, taking advantage of the situation. You know, <laughs> you fucking if I, dude, it's I, I can tell. I've been like, Leck has got diarrhea. I can't leave. <laughs> Let me think about it because I'm sure there's a whopper I'm forgetting. Well, most parents have oh, to. Oh, oh I've got a good one. Please. Um, in college, okay, in college, it was the last day to add or drop a class. Yeah. And it was my last semester and I wanted to get the fuck out. I'd already taken a semester off. So this I was like a five year student. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I could not fuck around. I was about to fail this class because I just fucking didn't it? go. This I don't even remember. This okay. is how long ago this is. Anyway, last day to add or drop a class. And I go to my whatever counselor's office. He's not there. And I'm like, fuck it. Executive decision. I forged the note that said I could add or drop that class. And I got caught <laughs> and I got um, put on like a disciplinary probation type of thing. Oh, yeah, dude. That's that's <laughs> just as bad as cheating. That's, I know I, that it's bad. Worse. That's forgery. Yeah, I know. I know. Fucking Julian so that's Assange a over here. <laughs> Jesus. I don't even know if he forged <laughs> documents. I just that was the fun word. But I saw it as a necessary evil. Yes, you had to do it. I had to justify it somehow. You had to do it. See, that kind of shit I would do like criminal um, I, I mean, would participate. I, like my stepdad changed my birth certificate, and he made me one year older so I could work uh, when I was fourteen. Yeah, legally in the state, of, like shit like that. I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense to me. It's fine. That's the immigrant in me. That's like just fucking. Do but it. that's also, it's not like you're doing anything wrong. You're just working. I, yeah. I'll get, I got, yeah. I got, I got a big lie okay. that okay. I've never gotten, got in trouble for. I used to call in fake prescriptions for <gasps> Vicodin all around Los Angeles. <laughs> A good one. Every Rite Aid, every CVS, I used to use. I'm not gonna say the doctor's name, but all you yeah, need don't was, say that. Right yeah, because it's I think it's statute of limitations. I think, but I'm not. Uh, but uh, all you needed was the <laughs> DEA number, and he was like Armenian, so I'd call and I'd be like, "Yes, I'm calling in prescription for," and I'd use I'd use like retired baseball players' names, so I'd be like, you know. Uh, we get prescription for Ozzy Smith and Oral Hershiser. <laughs> like I got caught once. Um, you got caught, so did you go to jail for that? Didn't get, didn't go to jail. I remember I what? went. So what happened was I called it in at a pharmacy on the corner of <clears throat> Crescent Heights and Ventura. It was the uh, fuck the. I know what you're talking about. Valley. Yeah, it's like a, it's a it's a Walgreens now. Was it? No, it was Crescent. Yes, yeah, so it was Laurel Canyon. And I remember I went in there and I'm waiting in line and. Uh, the um, like I'm waiting and I give the guy the fake name and then he starts ruffling these papers but he keeps staring at me and then eventually Ugh. he like and there's like 30 people in line waiting he goes he goes attention everyone this man right here called in a fake prescription <gasps> for Vicodin he goes if I ever see you in here again I will call the police so get out of here Mr. Ricky Henderson <laughs> and I was like I was like alright man and then I, I just I left and and then I went to a different pharmacy and called it in. Oh my god! You were him. you were deep in the addiction. I was though. deep. Yeah. It was it was it was the painkillers and stand up worked so perfectly because really? the first the first real show I ever had at the Hollywood Improv, 
uh, I took like 20 Vicodin that day. What? And I was just, but that was, what? my tolerance was so high. Yeah. And I was just so numb, but I was like, I wasn't afraid. I was only like three months into stand up and I was on a show with like Yasser Lester and Byron Bowers and Gerard Carmichael and all the guys I started with that were all more advanced than I was. So painkillers just made me comfortable. So I didn't think about right. being this young comic. I didn't think about how terrible my material was. I just went up there and had fun and was confident and would kill. And because of that show, every show I did after that, I was like, I'm only funny if I'm high. Yeah, so drugs are good, drugs, what you're saying. Drugs, drugs can be good. Do them. But let me ask you this. So most parents have to lie to their kids. And yeah. at some point, you're going to have to lie to your children. Yeah. Do you have any issues with that? Yeah, well, no, I'm sorry. I have no issues with lying to my children. No, absolutely not. That's stupid. You, you got to lie. It, Mom, did you ever do drugs? No, of course not. Drugs are bad. And I'm going to tell them that until they're old enough to understand otherwise. And then you'll be... And then I'll be like, open. yeah, well, if I can did LSD when I was 15, it was a bad idea. But also, they have everything I know. online. I know. Like, you I know. can never lie to them because you and you and Tom are so honest. I know. That it's all there. I remember Ryan said that. He's like, because he, like Ryan's like has his life documented. You have every fart and every <laughs> lots you know, of weird gay sex guy that I you're know. fucking with or whatever. I know. It's, it's I know. like, it's, I get it, but I get it. I think it's just a matter of age and, you know, I think you're going to raise some hip kids anyway. It's going to, ha- you know, here's the irony is that I, I would say that Tom and I behind closed doors are very traditional. We're very banal. We're very vanilla. So all that, we, all the wild stuff comes out on our show and comes sure. out in stand up. So back at home, it's pretty fucking boring. All right. Pretty girls make graves. Aww. I love this song to death. Peter, play the opening to it. Best line in this, uh, he says, I'm not the man you, you think, think I, I am. am. Uh, yes. I love the bass in this song. This bouncy tune is often considered to be Morrissey's turning down a woman's sexual advances yes. because of his homosexuality. Yes. However, a deeper exploration of the lyrics, and especially where the title comes from, reveals that it's lust itself that Morrissey is turning down. The title is from Jack Kerouac's 1968 novel, The Dharma Bums. Yes. Uh, In it, there's a line, I'd also gone through an entire year of celibacy based on my feelings that lust was the direct cause of birth, which was a direct cause of suffering and death. And I had really no lie come to a point where I regarded lust as offensive and even cruel. I don't know if Morrissey said that or that's from the book. Um, it sounds oh, like I think something. It's from the, I think it's from the book. And then Morrissey kind of co-opted yeah, the celibacy thing. Yeah, because then the next line is "Pretty girls makes graves." That's what I'm saying. So, uh, so I get okay. that. Morrissey celebrated celibacy, whether true or not, contributed to his legend. Have and I asked you last night, mm-hmm. but have you or anybody else questioned your sexuality? <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. I mean, I thought you go through. I think. I think. Um, by the way, so yeah, I'm sorry. I'm kind of blown away by what I just heard about this song, Pretty Girls Make Graves, because yeah, I thought I, this is the one thing I was like, Morrissey's not gay because he wrote about a song where girl, pretty girls make graves and chicks are awesome. And for years, I've interpreted things so differently. Yeah. And you you also think about how amazing a lyricist he really is. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. I mean, how intricate and complicated and layered the stuff is. And yeah. I don't know. I, I'm always blown away by people that write music. Like, how the fuck do you write a song? And it's all kind of vague and like, oh, I'm thinking about celibacy, but I'm not going to say it. I'm gonna yeah. c- it's like, I don't know. Lyrics it's are the hardest brilliant. thing. I've as a, as, a, as a person that was in bands and still to this day fucks around with one, uh, even when we do our comedy songs, it's like I can write the music in two seconds. The idea of writing lyrics I is hard, man, because you're like, oh, this is this is cheesy or this is like, yeah. you know, I got to make this rhyme. And, and so I've given, I've started and stopped so many songs. So, so big ups to anybody that's in a fucking band and has, you know, taken, made a fucking album. I mean, right. that's incredible. And it's particularly Morrissey. I mean, yeah. his lyrics are just mind blowingly good and intricate. 
wait, what am I asking? Oh, sexuality? The about yes, sexuality. of course. Now, I think nowadays they, you know, they've got so many labels for shit. Like, they label the fuck out of everybody, so you feel more comfortable. Yeah. I went to an all girls Catholic school, so of course there was like. There was a time in the 90s where everybody was either bisexual or lesbian for a minute. And then, you know, yeah, I went to school in San Francisco. So, you know, French, a couple girls, and that was it. But that's the extent of it. Yeah, it wasn't really like, no, that's not for me. I tried it, been there. How about you? How many dudes have you been with? 15, uh, (laughs) all named Ronaldo. Um, No, I never, I never, I never questioned my sexuality. I'm I'm actually more secure with it where it's like, I remember I was, I had friends that were super, uh, in high school that were super homophobic. I mean, it was just like, they, the, I remember we once watched the Tommy Lee and Pamela Anderson porno. Remember it. And we're watching it in my downstairs television and my, and the guys had to like, block out Tommy Lee's dick because oh, they thought they were gay. They thought that was gay if they looked at another man's penis. Right. And you're like, it's, you got a dick. I got it. It's, it's just a dick where, you know, like, what do you, how do you jerk off? Like that's, yeah, there's a stupid. dick in there. There's a dick. I was lucky enough that I became a raver at, oh, at yeah. 18 when I started going to raves and, and that was where I met homosexuals for the first time and really hung out with them and was like, oh, these guys are awesome. They <laughs> like to party. They have more drugs and do more drugs than more than anybody. And it just opened me up to it. Now, the idea of like, have I ever been gay? No, but it's just, you know, gay people are fine. Morrissey's yeah, the best, fine. dude. Yeah. So let me ask you this. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing about you? Oh, my God. I think, okay, all right. um, I think people think just because you can say crass shit on stage that you're inherently this crass, vulgar person all the time and that you're not a person. You know, that you're not layered and you have stuff, you have days. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you, you know that you get tweeted, people tweet, you fucking bitch. And you're like, I'm a, I'm still a person, guys. Like, Does I, that happen a lot? Yeah. I think you get to a certain place in your career and you get as much love as you do hate. And that's how, you know, people are paying attention to you. Um, but yeah, I guess that just that I'm, I may be an a-hole like on a podcast or on stage, but like, that's obviously me turned up. Yeah. You know, like not everybody goes home. Like Bill Burr's not at home. Like I fucking muffins all the time, no. or is he? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's definitely the on stage persona yeah. and the off. But it's like, how do you? So how do you process that when people are calling you out about it? Oh, that's their problem. You and you just, just realize, like, th- that's whatever you're projecting onto me. That's your fucking problem. For sure. I mean, look at the moss. Yeah, dude. He that's all he's doing. Uh, the hand that rocks the cradle. Oof, yeah. Now, uh, didn't really like this one that much. I kind of don't like this one either. I'll Thank be honest you. with you. Not Thank into you. it. Just one long poem and yeah. there's nothing musically that changes in the song. It's pretty repetitive. It does pick up a little at the end, but this is another song that's been up for interpretation. Is this about child abuse? Oof. Is it about a father that abandoned his child and then returned? Is it about parental obsession with children? Is it a bit of each or none? So this is something that we don't know. And in 1985, Morrissey told the Melody Maker, well, that comes from a relationship I had that didn't really involve romance. And we know the title comes from The Hand That Rocks the Cradle is The Hand That Rules the World, which is an 1865 poem by William Ross Wallace that praises motherhood as the preeminent force of change in the world. I think this is about a father who is fiercely protective of his child and also sympathetic to his child's fears. Mm. That's what I got from the lyrics. And he wants to make sure that he's the main influence in his child's life rather than his mother's. So he goes as far as singing a few lines from Al Jolson's 1928 sentimental tearjerker, Sonny Boy, a song of a father's devotion to his son. So what is your relationship like with your dad? Garbage. First of all, let me just say this: that Morrissey has always had a, a, a bizarre dynamic with children and procreation and yeah. people having children. It's a it's a theme that's in so much of his music and his lyrics. I think he's uh, disgusted at times by people that reproduce. There's that. L- it's seen to him as kind of vulgar and kind of masturbatory. I, I, I can totally see that. There's a song, Pregnant for the Last Time, which I just love. 
uh, tiny white sheets for, for the last time. And who's going to clean up? Would you be so kind? It's like it's mocking these women that push the pram around. And, and I love yeah. it. I just love his his... Anything, anything seen as traditional and banal, I think Morrissey has issue with. Yeah, which I is see fantastic. That. For I sure. <laughs> oh, my dad. I don't talk to him right now. He's a drunk. No, you don't talk to him. <laughs> no, not right now. We're on, we're on the boundaries. Talk. We, we had to affirm a boundary a while back. That's good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, but as a mother of yes. two boys, do you ever feel jealous about not connecting with your children in a way that Tom will? Oh, um, no. Because I don't understand boy stuff, and I'm glad that Tom's there to explain boy stuff. Yeah. I get to be the mom, which, if I do it right, if I do it well, is pretty fucking great it's already. Great. Yeah. Oh, I, there's I like always, the yeah, like, uh, the, the, the idea, like, I, I loved my dad, regardless if I didn't get along with him a lot of my life, I loved him. But but there's a connection with your mom that is so much deeper. You know, you, you carry the kids, and it's just, it's always been unconditional love with the mom. Oh, Whereas yeah. the dad's a little bit harder, and he's like, you know, you don't do this, and blah, blah, blah. You're, you're doing this wrong. My mom, even when I did bad, would still be, you know, she'd be my mom, and which was beautiful. Um, we already talked about this, I think. I think you might have answered this question, but we were talking about, you know, you, you know your, your stage act can be dirty. But in person, you know, you're extremely delightful. And Thank like you, you said, it's not, you. it's, you're not this, you know, filthy monster person. You're filthy I monster. Am. Are you prepared for when your kids uh, or their friends stumble across your shows online <laughs> or on TV? I mean, dude, listen, I, my kid already, my, they know who I am. Do you know what I mean? Like you, if you think you're hiding who you really are from your children, yeah. that's an illusion. You're delusional. They already know, bro. I don't need to say like sucking dicks and stuff in front of them, but they know me. They know my personality. They see me talking to Tommy and joking with their dad, who's a comic. Like they fucking see it. Yeah. I don't think they're going to be too surprised. And I don't think they're going to be that interested. From what I understand, like showbiz kids don't really give a shit what mom or dad does. They're just, you know, it's your mom or your dad. All right. This charming man. Ugh. Uh I, banger. I, the banger. I yeah. needed this one after the last song. Yeah. Uh, I just wrote, this is all I wrote. I just wrote, wow. Sorbet. Uh, play the opening uh, verse to this because oh, I love it. So do I. On Punctured bicycle on a hillside desolate. Will nature make a man of me yet? Mm-hmm. When in this charming car, this charming man, mm-hmm. why pamper life's complexities? complexities this on the leather run smooth on the passenger side. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. It's so good. Uh, this took me back to that 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 dance party in Baltimore Taxlo. It's so much fun. I love the way his voice quivers throughout. It's ah. like he's, oh, it's just <laughs> it's so. I love yeah. everything about this song. Me too. Now this was a single that was recorded independent of this album but added on to the american release later and in 1983 the smiths debuted it on i can't say that word for some reason debuted mm-hmm. and now debuted <laughs> that's what De- i want to say debuted De- they debuted it on the mm-hmm. british entertainment program top of the pops Love morrissey it. was holding gladiola flowers in his yes. hand swinging them around yes. while singing yep for most viewers, this was the first time they had seen the band and that iconic image caused fans to start bringing bouquets of flowers mm-hmm. to gigs in an effort to present them to Morrissey. What's the strangest thing a fan has ever given <laughs> or sent you? Morrissey. <laughs> T-shirt, mate. Okay, mate. Yes. Um, um, oh, I, get, I got jeans all the time. I have a denim guitar somebody made us. Really? A, a denim. Someone made... A painting of uh, Theo, our dog, wearing a Cosby sweater, and that hangs in our home to this day. I've gotten so many great, ridiculous things. Lots of toilets, lots of poop-related. Entire bags made of denim. What's the strangest, though? 
What's what's one? Is there anything that stuck out? Where you're like, what the fuck? Like they have way too much time on their hands, or whoever's doing the f- the fapping. Is that the guy or the guy that's doing putting the, the face? Faking it, the yeah. fakening. That so guy great. is just so brilliant. It's so amazing. I would say the guitar covered in denim that we just received was pretty amazing. It's in the studio. <laughs> An entire guy he covered a guitar in denim. Which is and it looks flawless, like it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty nutty. All right. Lyrically, this is about a bike ride that ends with a flat tire on a deserted hill. Mm-hmm. Then a charming male stranger in a charming car drives by and offers a ride and a flirt and an offer to go out later, which is turned down because the bicyclist doesn't have nice clothes. Mm-hmm. Now, this is also a metaphor de- depicting the story of a poor boy coming in contact with the upper class but feels unwelcome due to his lack of material wealth. Basically, mm-hmm. class struggle. Mm-hmm. Big, s- big in English. Uh, sorry, in, in this era, this is a Margaret Thatcher thing, yeah? I, I think this is what the next thing is. Uh-huh. Morrissey uh-huh. told Undress in 1984 that this latter line was written for per- from personal experience. For years and years and years, I never had a job or any money. Consequently, I never had any clothes whatsoever. I found mm-hmm. that on those very rare occasions, when I did get invited anywhere, I would constantly sit down and say, good heavens, I couldn't possibly go to this place tonight because I don't have any clothes. Aww. I don't feel like I have any shoes. So I'd miss out on all those foul parties. It was really quite a blessing in disguise. Hmm. I get this. I get it too, yeah. Because I, I wrote here, I go, I get this because I want to be invited just so I can turn it down. <laughs> I, that's why I hate social media because when I see the party that I didn't get invited to and I'm like, why, uh, why didn't they invite me? And then yeah. I'm like, I'm sitting on my couch with the dog, you know, I'm not going anywhere. So even if I yeah. got the invite, I wouldn't fucking do it. That's true. Morrissey adding some rare silver linings to his dark clouds from this. Now, were you ever poor or were you ever like, I remember you grew up from an immigrant family. Yeah, of course. So did you guys have like money situations when you were younger? Of course. Yeah. Uh, We're, you know, yeah, immigrant. And then uh, by, by the 90s, my parents had acquired some stuff. But I grew up lower middle class, as Ryan Sickler would say. Yeah, but also, yes. but also in the San Fernando Valley in the eighties and the nineties. Yeah. So, did you know those pampered Valley girls? I did. In their charming cars, going and to the Galleria. Child. By the way, the best line ever is, "What is it? Why ponder life's complexities when the leather runs smooth on the passenger seat?" I mean, how fucking brilliant is that? So good. And, oh, and he sings it. How does he? Sing this it? is this is my favorite song on the record. Oh, it's fantastic. This is my favorite song on the record. This is the most accessible one. This is one that if you're gonna play, get somebody into the Smiths. From what I know off this album, this would be yo. Listen to this is the jam. A charming man. Yeah. But so but it's so charming. so while you were so you're growing yeah, sorry, up with those sorry, pan- yeah. no 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 growing you're fine. up broke. But you, you're, you're around those pampered people from the yes, valley. Yes, and that's why I became goth, because I couldn't afford guest jeans. Guest jeans were like the big I thing. Remember. Sixth oh, grade, yeah. The triangle. Yeah, the triangle. <laughs> and like Keds, my parents would not buy me Keds. I were got, Keds good? I don't know if they were good, because I never got a pair. I got Pro Wings I from Payless. I remember Pro Wings from Payless. Payless Pro Wings. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. I remember them. There was a time, I remember in my high school, because I had some rich kids that went there. The Pro Wings became in. No. For a minute. Yeah, I remember that. That's not cool. They, I mean, it was Come like on. the ironic, like, oh, you got new pro wings? Like, hey. I remember that 100%. <laughs> Kangaroos. I used to get those from the pharmacy. Um, but that's what turned me goth is because I couldn't. It's like that pretty and pink thing. Like, if you don't fit in with the those girls, you make your own shit. And back then, they didn't have Hot Topic. Like, goths had to go down to Aardvarks on Melrose <laughs> or go to the fucking thrift store. Aardvarks. And, like... You had to find vintage shit, and you know that was my way of being cool. Because yeah. So did that spark a fire in you growing around those kids? Yeah, like it ha- made me weird. Just made, so it turns you more weird, like yeah. more anti what they yep. were doing. Because they were popular and cool, and I I had no friends. I had one friend Jenny in sixth grade. Yeah. And I I didn't have the cool jeans. I wasn't cool enough to be a cheerleader. I had buck teeth, and I didn't have braces yet. And and um. Like I said, I had this one friend and her sister was goth. <laughs> her older sister, Jessica, she listened to Joy Division and her room was painted black. And I was oh like, oh my God, in the cure. And I was like, oh, this is fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> I like those kids. And then I, that's when I got locked into it all. I was like, that this is for me because it's an outsider culture. Yeah. I'm not going to get in. So I so may as well spe- celebrate. Speaking of you being goth, did yeah. you then or do you now look at those things for the silver linings or do you see the dark clouds? Like, do you what see things? what what I'm saying is, do you 
do you now see silver linings or do you still see dark clouds? <laughs> I see both. Yeah. I see the fact that uh, I see the, the futility and the silliness and the existential whatever of stuff. We're all going to die. We're going to be yeah. worm meat sooner or later. And uh, at, the, at the same time, that is so freeing and liberating. And if you're ever second guessing yourself in yes. life, you're 100%. like, guess what? You're going to fucking die. And you're lucky enough, if you're listening to this podcast, chances are you have enough money to have some kind of a smartphone. Yeah. You're probably in a better part of the world than, say, Calcutta or Afghanistan right now. You're in the right part of the world, if you can hear this yeah. program. <laughs> so just that alone yeah. and born in a human incarnation. And if you're lucky, you're, you're healthy and you're good looking and yeah. you got some shit going for you. You don't have pro wings. Yeah, I got no pro wings, but that's okay. But always, you always have to embrace what you do have. And yeah, exactly. I was a darker fucking spirit, but you parlay that into good stuff, right? For sure. Fuck. So Johnny Marr was also very jealous of a of a, the success of a single "Walk Out to Winter" by label mates Aztec Camera, and in, mm. and in anticipation of a recorded appearance by DJ John Peel's BBC radio program composed this song so they could appeal to a wider audience. So because of mm. that other song, he wrote this because they knew they were like, this other band's getting more shine. We want some shine too. Damn. Have you ever been jealous of any specific person's career? Oh my God. I, for the longest time, was jealous of everybody's career. Everybody? Like, I would say early on, Whitney Cummings. I would be like, man, how does this chick know what she's doing? Uh, she needs to fucking teach a seminar on showbiz. I think there's a lot of people I looked at early and I was like, wait, how did they do this? Yeah, and how did they make that jump? How does that work? And I mean, you get perspective later because you're like, oh, whenever I feel envious of some, something someone else is doing, that means that that's something I want to do as well. Because yeah. if it doesn't aggravate you that someone else has got that thing, you just go, oh, it's not for me. I don't care. Yeah. But if you're fired up, now I see that more, not about that other person. It's more about what I'm ignoring in me that needs to get done kind of shit yeah but yeah i would say whitney cummings totally because she was like right out of the gate man the sitcom that's all i've specials. heard that's all i've heard because I, really? I, by the time i showed up she was already doing shit yeah and it was like you'd see so many comedians and like especially like i knew you i remember the first time i met you at the downtown comedy club oh my god and it's like you're, you're hysterical and then you laid in the cut and then it was like over the last what say like four or five years where it just really changed. And then it's yeah. like, so it's it's one of those things where the best advice I ever got uh, was after I did New Faces. Um, I remember everybody I went to New Faces with was doing shit. Everybody. Pete Davidson was blowing up. Santino was blowing up. Aparna. Fucking everybody. And I still had a DJ at the strip club. <laughs> and I was miserable. It's the best. And uh, Gerard Carmichael... Uh, who it's funny to, for him to give me this advice, but it still made so much sense because he was so successful. He was that guy that I was jealous of. We started together and he was just plucked out and just taken. Oh, he's to, one of those. He's one of the golden children. Yes. And But he gave me the best advice. He goes, he goes, take your own test. Hmm. Stop looking at everybody else's test. Take mm -hmm. your own test. You know the answers. Just do the work, study for the exam and you're going to ace it. But just 100%. keep doing the work. And it's, but it's hard it's hard when it's like, you know, people are, you know, I'm not, not saying people are less talented than you, but it's just like, no, but I'm doing everything right. Why aren't I moving up? It just, it, you know what I mean? It's just, you can feel stuck. Totally. But then you realize there, this business, there's sometimes not a lot of rhyme or reason to it. And it sometimes can be down to like, who's representing you? What the, what what is sellable yeah, no, you're right. at yeah. the moment hey guess what right now uh we need to have one-legged multicultural <laughs> non-binary female comedians well guess what it's your time it's your lucky number <laughs> yay you know i just i i was recently in the i was interviewed by the new york times because they did this article on pregnancy and how there's this thing of female comics now doing specials pregnant and they're like what happened how did this happen it's like no Pregnancy and having children was considered a liability back in Joan Rivers' time. They had oh, yeah. to hide the fact. She couldn't say she was pregnant on yeah. television. Now, because it's marketable and they can make money off of it, now all of a sudden it's a it's a great thing to be a mom comic. Yeah. So it's just the climate. It sometimes has nothing to do with what you're doing. I it's know. just the time, I the know. timing.
Speaking of a charming man, yes. For the listeners uh, that don't know, you're married to fellow comedian Tom Segura. Yes. How did Tom first charm you? <laughs> <laughs> He's the most charming. When I met Tommy, he was 23 years old. I was 26, and I'll, I the my first time I met him I was at this uh, place I was booking. No, no, it's the Cat Club. But then I booked him at this room I used to do Tangier. Uh, Tangiers is where I did my first stand-up set. It was oh, on uh, Hillhurst. Yes. I bombed so <laughs> bad. Really? Dude, I, not to cut you off. Not on but my show. Was no, it on, I, not on I my met show. these guys on Beachwood. I was I, at, at Birds one night. We Love were doing Birds. coke together. And I told the guy <laughs> I was a comic. I had done comedy three times in Washington, D.C. Oh, no. And, and the guy was like, cool. Well, you can headline. I'll pay you $150. You do a half hour. I was like, done. Whoa. Uh, I had no material. Like, I had nothing. And I remember I invited, like, 10 people to oh, it. Oh, no. My cousin and his girlfriend, who's now married to, and a guy I worked with, and they were all there. And I remember I walk in, and if, if the Tangiers, if, if, if I feel like every night was probably like this. The, the showroom was so dark. Mm-hmm. Like, you couldn't see anything. That's why I liked it. Yeah, it was so dark. And I'm on stage, like, probably, like, two minutes in, and I'm just eating <laughs> shit. Like, so bad. And the only row of people that's illuminated in the crowd is my cousin and his girlfriend. Everybody else is in the dark. And I just remember seeing my cousin's face, like <gasps> just trying to give oh. me that nice smile. I was supposed to do a half hour. I think I ended up doing four minutes. Oh my God. Oh my God. And did he pay you? No. No. No, he, he couldn't have. He, he, no, I, I, I left. <sighs> like there was no time to. <laughs> you bailed. <laughs> could, could you imagine if I went up to him? I was like, so uh, yeah. still 150. <laughs> I'll take cash if you got it. No right. fucking way. So back to back to, okay, to okay. back to Tom. So, so you book him on Tangiers. Book him on Tangier because he's like the fucking closer. I mean, Tom Segura, I always say this, was always good at stand up. Yeah. He's he's this motherfucker who at, you know, twenty years old, first time out of the gate, was we all knew he was gonna be fantastic. Yeah. He never struggled, Tommy. And I remember I he goes, Hi, and we we were saying hello to each other. And he kissed me on he kissed my cheek. He did that European thing. Yeah. And Hungarians do that too. Like my in your my culture, you do one kiss here and one on well, the other cheek. And I just remember going, "Oh, how European of him!" Like it was so foreign. And he was such a gentleman, and he wasn't like the other comics. You know what I mean? He was a grown ass man at twenty three. Um, and that was the first time he charmed me. Is the, the the kiss on the cheek? And I was like, "Oh, he's such a gentleman." Did you guys go out immediately or was no. it like a courtship? No, we became friends for many years. I was dating this other guy. I broke up with the other guy. And then uh, I had a friend tell Tommy that I liked him. And I was oh, like, Oh, you made the you yeah, made the move. Yeah. Okay. I was like, go tell Tom Segura to call me. <laughs> 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 and then yeah, and that's when we started going out. And I knew I would marry him. We were at a backyard party, down fourth France. I don't know if you remember him. I no, think it was his remember. party. And he offered me a piece of cheesecake in the backyard and he was backlit like the sun was behind his head and it created like this halo. And I looked up at Tom and he looked like Jesus, you know, like sparkling. <laughs> and I remember going, I think I'm going to marry Tom Segura. Oh, yeah. And I was 28 years old and I was like, this is the guy. And I just knew I just knew. And we started dating and that was that. That was it was on a lock, dude. How long until he, uh, you guys started farting in front of one another? Oh, that's him. That was like <laughs> one month in. He put my hand in his crotch and he farted <laughs> on my hand. And I was like, this is it. This is love, bro. Is this love <laughs> that I'm feeling? Is this the love? Still ill. I like it. All jam, right. jam. This, this kind of reminds me of uh, the hand that rocks a cradle a little bit. Oh. Because uh, nothing really changes in the entire song once I like again. It. Play the intro, Peter. It's often claimed that this song is about the then recent decriminalization of homosexuality mm. and a fuck you to the previous generation's definition of homosexuality as an illness. Uh, but I've also read that from online multiple different sources that 
the comments that this is a lyrical takedown of the political fallings during the time of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's mm. era of leading England, especially when she advised a struggling England to spend its way out of an economic downturn. Also could be about both. Uh, thoughts or anything? No. Does the body rule the mind or does the mind rule the body? Let me ask you that. Know. Let me ask you that. Does your body rule your mind or does your mind rule your body? Uh, I'm all mind all day. All mind? No body. Yeah. I'm just a rolling around. Yeah. I'm trying to sink them a little bit, yeah. but my mind, I'm actually finally having a, a part of my life where my mind doesn't control me. Oh, that's I'm not. Yeah, dude, it's a lot What's of that. What's that like? <laughs> How do you do that? Uh, I, I Honest to God, meditation. Yeah, I do Medi- that. Meditation do that. Has, has changed my life. It's taken me to where I, I used to, I used to be afraid to go out to, to do spots. I used to, I was like, before that whole existential crisis, it was like, the idea of going to the comedy store, it like scared me. Yeah, it should. It's fucking intimidating. But why? Because but why? it's got this legacy, this history, and it used to be way more hostile. Oh, before I, that's Adam when I took started. over. No, that's when I started. That's when I when started. I, yeah, oh, yeah oh. so when I, so Tommy passed you, and I remember when I started, there was no Adam. There was no, it was dead. I mean, it was yeah. fucking dead every night, and all the comics ran the asylum. It was yeah. literally like, if you went to do the open mic, like, dude, I mean, and you didn't have a good set, like, the host would shit on you. I mean, shit <laughs> on you. So fucked up. But the thing was, it was just, that was, like you said, like that's just projecting. That's yeah, just everybody they're busting insecure. balls. Because they're insecure. Yeah. And now I can look at all of that and be like, oh, I'm completely fine. And if somebody's busting my balls, I, can, I know that, well, now I know that I'm friends with everybody. Yeah. Because there's a love. But it was just, I fought that love from people, and I just took it as, like, competition. All right, so... There are also two more women that Morrissey became preoccupied by. I know. They need to be mentioned. Yes. Uh, you know them? I do know. Hold on. But say the names because I forget now. Myra Hindley. No. And Viv Nicholson. No. Sorry. Totally wrong. <laughs> Both are wrong. But I knew he was a, he was enamored of some. There was a woman. He's. Well, all right. So this a lot of the music is about this. Myra Hindley was a murderer and rapist. Whoopsies. Who, yeah, Never know, mind. Who, with her boyfriend, uh, Ian Brady, committed the Moors murder. Yes. Take me to the Moors. While serving a life oh. sentence in 77, Myra famously said, society owes me a living. Which yes. is rumored to be where Morrissey. He got the line, England is, is mine. mine. It owes me a living. Yes. There will be much more about this more murder in a few songs. Yeah, that's the worst song on the album. Viv, yeah, the last one. I can't take it. Yeah, I don't I really can't like listen it to it. Viv Nicholson was a British woman whose husband in 1961 won the equivalent of a few million dollars in the football pools, which were a collection of bets on a large number of soccer games. When asked what she was going to do after, she told the press she would spend, 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 spend. And then did until they were broke in about three years. Her addiction to consumerism is echoed in this Thatcher era song, as is an image she described in her autobiography that referred to her kissing under an iron bridge until she got sore lips. Hmm. Uh, Viv's picture are also Viv's pictures are also on several of the Smiths' record covers. Oh, that's her. Yeah. So. Uh, the follow-up questions are, what are your obsessions? Oh, my God. I have so many. What are they? <laughs> well, how much time do you got? I mean, <laughs> I'm obsessed. Okay, my husband would say I'm obsessed with Howard. I listen to Howard Stern every day. Yeah. I'm obsessed with that. That's just, that's show. not, that's, that's not, I won't even call that so much an obsession. That's just your, that's like, that's like, like Howard Stern is like matzo ball soup. It's just comfort food. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you wake up in the morning, you have your cup of coffee, you, you do diddling with the kids. You're like, ah, right, you go over there, you eat this. And then you have Howard playing and it just takes you back to that kid that was yeah. listening to him a long time ago. It's just, it's just consistency. That's, those are, the, he's my, yeah. And I liked, I have to listen to him every day. And, yeah. And know what's going on in that world. Uh, right now I'm obsessed with this. Is Gary still buck tooth? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank God. Just got to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Crazy midget man. He's it. there. Oh, I God. love it. It's so, it's so comforting. It Beetlejuice is. still batshit crazy? Juice. Perfect. I love it. <laughs> Right now, I'm obsessed with TikTok, that app where people uh, put music. To, like the, It's like a Vine, but with music. It's so dumb. I get obsessed with that. I Is get that obsessed. the singing app? Yeah. Is that yeah, so you, you, can, you like, listen you can, to the song and you sing yeah, to it? Yeah. I love it. I've, I'm really into that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obsessed. I am obsessed with the Clash right now because there is this podcast on Spotify. Yes, 
um, that Chuck D is narrating. I know. I've listened to the first oh, part of it. It's great. It's fucking, and it, I'm obsessed with that right now. It's blowing my mind. So your obsessions are more with, with, well, with like I, okay. apps? I'll tell you what else I'm into. I get obsessed with movies. I get looped on. For instance, there's a room in my house that's an homage to the Royal Tenenbaums. I actually got... <laughs> Uh, similar wallpaper to the one Margot Tenenbaum has in her room yeah. in that movie. Like I, I get obsessed with that. Um, I go down deep rabbit holes intellectually for a while. Yeah. Yeah. On different books and different people and things. Yeah. So to follow up with this about the the British woman and her husband. Oh my how god. Are, how are you with money? Oh, I have like poor person's mentality. <clears throat> I'm afraid of it. I try not. I don't like. I'll put it this way. Yeah. We we actually have money now, and my idea of like a blowout spending spree is going down to Michael's Arts and Crafts, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm gonna spend whatever I want, and that may be like, like $100 a hundred dollars, yeah. and I I feel like a fucking millionaire. What's the most you know? extravagant thing that you've ever bought? That's that's what I'm fucking telling you. Like I for Come Christmas, on, there's got to be something, dude. I went to Michael's what's, and I bought like three hundred dollars worth of Christmas ornaments, and I, I was like, this is crazy. You know what's funny is that I was you know I've seen your husband's cars, and then I saw <laughs> yours, and I was like, well, that's great. It's a great car. <laughs> I know. I wasn't expecting it i was expecting more on the tom side but no because i he goes what do you want for your where our lease is up we had a mercedes and i go i just want like a regular i just want like a jeep i don't want a nice car i don't yeah. need it what for you don't who am i impressing well that's i the don't thing. fucking care that's the thing is that like you're i just came to that realization with money where when i first started getting money back in 2017 all i wanted to do was was buy things to impress people Right. Like I got a nice car, I bought a nice watch, I did all this shit. And it's like, I mean, I had that kind of money, but at the same time, it wasn't making me happy. It was just the idea of it to see somebody go, oh, is that, you know, that's a brand new Lexus. Like that, right. that made me feel good. And now when I went through that whole crisis, I realized that I don't want anything extravagant anymore. I just want my time. Time is everything. Everything. And I'll tell you what I like about money. You want to have enough money where you don't think about money. Yes. That to me is the joy of money, yeah. truly. And I don't poo-poo material things. I think Tommy loves cars. That's his thing. It's his thing. And if he can afford it, let him fucking have it. But for me, I just I mean, it doesn't doing, bring me joy. He is doing fifty <laughs> dates. I mean, you're like you're like you better do some more dates, Tom. <laughs> better announce some more. <laughs> it's not me driving that train. I'm like I'm happy with what like, we got, I bro. Got, I got some dates. Don't worry. Yeah. But I got. I got Jeep dates. You got Jeep? Yeah, I fucking need it. Yeah. I got Michael's Arts and Crafts yes, dates. Yes, pay less. Come on now. Uh, hand in Glove. Oh, I like this one. Great song. Yeah. Great song. Musically, the song reminds me of a sped up version of Shiny Happy People by R.E.M. <laughs> it just, that's all I heard. Peter, play the intro. You're terrible. This was the band's first single that was released by Rough Trade Records in 1983. According to Morrissey, he received a cassette of this instrumental from Johnny and wrote the lyrics in two hours around the same time Crazy. they were still playing their first few shows. He said about it was complete loneliness, mm. and it was important to me that there'd be something searingly poetic about it in a lyrical sense and yet jubilant at the same time. The first time we hear this phrase is at the end of Pretty Girls Makes Graves. And I think this Oh is, yeah, he says it in that song first. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a great love song that just screams teenage rebellion yes. and shared disgust with the rest of the world. Yes. But it's beautiful. What is the most romantic thing that's ever happened to you? Aww. I'll tell you what, okay. 
My Cheesecake. husband. Cheesecake. <laughs> Porno. Butt sex. My husband, for my for a birthday su- a surprise, flew in my best friend. Was it to Los Angeles or San Francisco? Like, she literally pulled up and popped out of a car, and we had no money at the time to do such a thing. And I was like, oh, that's like the nicest thing. Oh. Yeah. He's always very romantical, so. That's like, really He always great. books hotels for us. He still does that, so we get away from our children for night. Yeah, he's a good. He always does stuff like that, though. That's great. He's sweet. That's what keeps it. That's what keeps it. The love, like yeah. you gotta, you gotta, you gotta add spice to the situation. You yeah. know what I mean? And even if the littlest thing is romantic, so Dude, at a certain point, all the time. He's yeah. so sweet. That's beautiful. He's the best. According to Morrissey, there's so much buried in the past to steal from. Once again, Morrissey steals a bunch of lines and ideas from Sh- Sheila Delaney's play, A Taste of Honey. Basically, he says, I'm not saying everything I write has been written before, but most of the way I feel comes from the cinema, and I fed myself on films like A Taste of Honey. Now, Wow. Yeah, so he's extremely inspired, and he wears it on his sleeve. I didn't know that. Neither did I. I never knew this. But also, we work in a business where stealing is probably the worst thing that you can do. (laughs) Have you ever caught anybody stealing any of your jokes? Yes. (laughs) Yes, and very I quickly. and I I very I just pulled that person aside and very gently said, "Hey, I think we're stepping on each other's toes, and I I think I've been doing that, and I think I think you should not do that." And they were like, "Cool, I'm so sorry." End of story. End of it. They were like, "You know, I I queef too, though." I queef. Like, yeah, but <laughs> it's not a queef joke. That's my queef joke. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. Have you? Um, I, I had a situation a long time ago where I, th- where I thought somebody was stealing from me cause it was mm. very similar and looking back at it now, I think it was parallel thinking. Ah, there's that um, too. They were a far bigger comedian than I was. Oh. Um, and we had it out. And also at a certain point, I think the guy's a brilliant comedian. Yeah. I really do. And, and I mean, it was like, I carried around a lot of anger really uh, because I was jealous of that mm. person for a long time. Uh, because while he had gotten the special on his, he got he got the joke on his special. I remember people were hitting me up like, "You have a joke just like that," and I was working at the strip club. Right, and it's just that feeling that right now he's right. watching that with his family, and I'm here. But the thing is, I, I honestly God think it's parallel thinking. There's a lot of that that happens, and I I don't I don't call people out yeah. on stealing stuff a lot because it's like, dude, uh, no. Well, him and I are now friends. Oh, that's and cool. I and because I I really do respect the guy. He's made me laugh, and also it's like I'd rather have a friend yeah. than have an enemy, and I can't prove it, and so I just said let it go and just you know. If it happens again, that's something else. That's but different. like there's but there's just like there's no point. I have if it's really come to somebody I know has stolen a joke, I mean uh I don't think so. I, I I've never really caught somebody just doing something verbatim, you know. But it that's happens. the thing but that's the thing though, Christina, is that if if people can steal my material, then it's I need not to that write, good. I agree that good. too. I'm like, so, oh, I'm not doing such so that's so I dropped I started making everything as personal as possible. Yes. All right. What difference does it make? Oh, it's a good jam. It's a fucking jam. One of my favorite songs on the album. Peter, play two minutes and 20 seconds in. This is the first single from the album, and Morrissey has said that he doesn't really like the lyrics at all. What? Yeah. He even criticized them by saying they sounded like something written by Duran Duran, (gasps) Simon Le Bon. I love Simon Le Bon. He's great. Lyrically, it sounds like the singer is being snubbed by a friend after they tell them a secret. Some fans think this is about being gay. Once again, he sings about feeling sick and ill. Mm-hmm. What's the worst you've ever been snubbed? Sick and ill today. <clears throat> um, I hey, you brought up Montreal. Yeah, I would say those people snubbed me for a long time. Really? Oh my god, I never got new faces. Never, never. And there was like two or three years in a row where it was 
it was I would be down to like the last few people that they would decide on. And I swear it was like three years in a row of like, you know, it got so close. They really loved uh, you. But then, you know, it was always like Nikki Glazer or Amy uh, Schumer. Yeah. There, there's like some other blonde, you know, <laughs> filthy white girl. And I was like, God damn it. Which, by the way, I do like those two people. I don't per- personally hold But it. at a certain point, you're like, why? It's like, yeah. You're, you're telling me they have to get everything? Right. <laughs> it's yeah. like you can't break off some to little Hungarian chick. <laughs> I know. And it was so it was so annoying. And even to this day, I'm kind of like, nah, I'm good. Like yeah. you guys kind of didn't. You kind of weren't there for me in the beginning, so no thanks. I heard that from a lot of comedians. Yeah. Like a lot of comics, especially that are very successful, that are like, you know, I, the festival has been very good to me. And, uh, to and be, that's great if and it that's is. Great. And God. it's and like, you know, when, when Robbie and Robbie for a long time ago gave me the biggest break because he gave me new faces when I had such a shitty agent. Like, so I, it wasn't like I was backed by Three Arts or UTA. Right. It was just, I was rent by Shakey's Pizza. Right. Fucking, I had nothing. And he gave me new faces. <gasps> And then Robbie also was the guy that brought me his last year as the head of JFL was the year that he brought the goddamn comedy jam. Oh, and he, wow. was, he was literally said to me, he's like, I'm going to change your life. He goes, That's I've awesome. always loved you. I want to help you. He's like, so take this. You'll do a week of shows. And now Nick, the new guy has been very, very helpful. And I get it. You know, I feel there's some clubs out here that I feel snubbed by, but at the same time, it just makes me work harder. So anything, right. any no I get, is just is just fuel. Well, and yeah, and just so you know, eventually they all come around, yep. and then they'll come sniffing. Oh, they're probably on your motherfucking ass, girl. <laughs> I know. Now I'm like, mm, no, thank you. But but in Robbie Pra's defense, he's the guy over at Netflix who gave me the green light on Mother Inferior yeah. and The Degenerate. So it's like. I have him to thank for me being on Netflix. So, it, so it worked thank out. you, Robbie Pra. So it worked out. It <laughs> yeah, worked, it worked out, out just great. It's like it's like the idea. Like there's a lot of people that that wanted new faces, never got it. And the thing is, it's not even remotely close to what it once was. Right. Yes. Where it's like you get it and it changes your life. Now it's just it's just another stepping stone. It, it, it's in it all. Listen, man. The best thing about show business, and especially today, or because of the internet. If you don't get in on the front door, there's a window, there's a latch, yeah. there's a fucking keyhole, there's a peephole, there's a way in. Create and a podcast. Hell yes. Just create. Oh, and there's one piece of shit, garbage person, Kansas City, Stanford and Sons. Yeah. Craig Glazier told me, I was on Chelsea lately, and I har- I was harassing him for a week. Please, 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 but, we, but he goes, you know, I finally got a hold of him. He goes, you know, Christina... I've already booked two women this year. I can't have another. And that was his reason for not booking me. So that's another one I'll never do. It's on my my short list of people who will never have my business. Well, that's going to lead into our (laughs) next question. Uh, So the next song, I Don't Owe You Anything. Great title. Peter, play a minute seven into the song. This is this is probably one of my favorite parts on the whole album. Oh, uh, oh I don't want to go out tonight. Yes. Oh, but you will, for you must. Just that that part, whatever <laughs> Peter just played, is incredible. This is a song of refusal over Mars' beautiful guitar. It's also sort of a hashtag Me Too moment. It's great to hear somebody saying that just because they are being nice or they've been bought some booze, they don't have to go any further than they feel comfortable. Ooh. Because that's basically what the song is. It's about him trying, somebody's trying to fuck Morrissey. Or, okay. So, this is really an album about fucking. I mean, it Big, really is. Big Black has that album, Songs About Fucking. Yeah. Because he believes that basically all of rock is fucking. Pretty much. It is. And if you wondered, yes, Morrissey threw in another line from A Taste of Honey. So like I said, this is about somebody advancing on you and you saying, so he's like, I don't want to go out tonight. And then the person's like, oh, but you will, for you must. Have you had any Me Too moments? (laughs) Why am I laughing at that? Um, Where, like, in in the workplace, isn't that what that means? Yeah, I mean, or just in life. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think specifically. Yeah, I had a guy in college 
tried to French me and I pushed him off of me after a date. Yeah. And I think that's as close as like, but I, we didn't work together. It wasn't like that. I've been very fortunate in show business, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. Maybe it's because I dated uh, Tom. Tom and I have been together for so long. I think that kind of protected me because oh, I yeah, think completely. men knew, like, yeah. if you fuck with this girl, that big guy over there is gonna fucking Did kill you. Have, you. But what about when you first started? I know. Before? I'm I mean, because that's like, I mean, I'll be honest. Like, looking, I never had. I wasn't. I've never been like no sexual advances, not rude to women. That's just not how I am. It's like, I'm a good looking guy. So it's just, it doesn't I, have to, it doesn't, yeah, I don't have, have to. Have to. I can, I can, yeah. I've, I've gotten laid before, but knowing in comedy, there's so many nerdy guys that yeah. have no game whatsoever. So they, you know, when we were starting off, I mean, there was just rude shit being said to <laughs> yeah. women or, or, or yes. You know. I, here's the thing is that I honestly, I grew up in such a more of a hostile environment, like the old comedy store, for instance, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, countless rude shit. Lots of things have been said to me. Has anyone put their dick out on me? No. Uh, no. Have yeah. I ever been assaulted? No. Have I heard crazy shit? Yes. Has crazy shit been said to me? Yeah. yeah. I'm a big girl, though. Go fuck yourself. I can yeah. answer for myself. It's like, no. I'd say I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And now the final song on the no, record. I don't our, like our it. Our least favorite one. Don't like it. Never have liked it. Suffer Little Children. No. I wrote the same thing. I didn't really like this song. It has these weird key changes in it that threw me off. Don't like it. Also, he keeps referring to Manchester too yes. much. He's like, Manchester, oh, Manchester, Manchester. The title is a phrase found in Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 14, in which Jesus rebukes his disciples for turning away a group of children and says, Suffer little children and right. forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I got a lot of shit to say right here, so hold tight. This haunting and bleak song is one of the first Morrissey and Marr wrote one of the first songs Morrissey and Marr wrote together. Morrissey really? wrote the lyrics after reading Beyond Belief, A Chronicle of Murder, and its Ugh. detection by Emmeline Williams. Now, we mentioned Myra Hindley earlier for Still Ill. Myra Hindley and her boyfriend, Ian, were English serial killers who together committed the rapes and right. murders of five small children in uh, Manchester between... Yeah, that's the noises Morrissey makes throughout the I song. I know. Between 63 and 65. These become known as the Moors yes. murders for the area where the bodies were buried. Morrissey would have been about seven when they got caught, and with all the information about the murders being in the daily newspapers and on the news... He understandably developed a fearful fascination with him, which Oof. I get. In his autobiography, Morrissey reflected on the effect that had. A swarm of misery grips mid-60s Manchester as Hindley and Brady raise their faces to the cameras and become known to us all. He also wrote, everyone appears to know someone who knew Myra Hindley. We are forced to accept a new truth that a woman can be just as cruel and dehumanized as a man hmm. and that all safety is an illusion. Wow. So, He's so fucked up. I would love to be on his psychoanalyst. Oh, yeah. So let me ask couch. you this. How goth is too goth? <laughs> Dude, on like... On a scale of gothness, sure, how goth sure. is Morrissey? He's, he's the ultimate OG of it all and I, I, I don't think he's given nearly enough credit for it. He's the fucking master. And and I'll tell you something what I like about his gay gothness that I hadn't considered before. <laughs> a gay goth? A gay goth. <laughs> and, and he is. Because, you know, again, I grew up thinking he was asexual. But he's quite clearly a gay man being gothy. Straight men being depressed blow their brains out. You got Ian Curtis, a joy division, sorry, who ha he hanged himself. But, yeah. you know, his lyrics are like, really? Mother, I've tried. Please believe me. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm ashamed of the things I've been put through. I'm, oh, I'm ashamed excited of the to person to that I am. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's really like, mother, I've tried. I'm a fucking loser. Isolation. Yeah. And then you have this flowery Morrissey, but he's yeah. also talking about child murder. And then it, the, this album starts with the child well, you think child fucking, but it's really yeah. about something else. But the loss of innocence. But yeah, I mean, he's but the, the way he fra but the way he frames it yes. is, is definitely the pedophilia. You know, <laughs> themes are there. So on a level of he's goth, ultimate goth. So like we're talking, you know, hot topic. Or are Peter we talking Murphy? Peter? Who's that? Bauhaus, the lead oh, singer of Bauhaus. He's like OG goth too. He's pretty hardcore. He's still a vampire. 
Uh, so how is it now listening to these songs uh, as you become an adult? I know. I have to be honest. This this album, in retrospect, now is not my favorite Smiths album. Yeah. Because th- I didn't realize how dark it uh, it was. Now the jams on here are still are fucking great. bangers, dude. But it's definitely this is definitely a dark fucking yeah. Record, and yeah. I and I'm quite surprised that as their debut album, it was such a hit. I got I gotta be, I gotta tell you because. Is pretty grim compared to the other ones. It, it's listen. I'm glad I'm putting this one to rest. <laughs> like, I'm glad I'm moving on to George Michael Faith. <laughs> oh my god! Literally after okay, this. Okay, well I'm coming back for London Calling, and we'll do a peppier Perfect. episode. Perfect. Can you do a couple facts? Do you have a couple? Yeah, minutes? yeah, for okay. sure. And we're giving you facts, and you really just facts. <laughs> All right, frontman Morrissey met guitarist Johnny Marr in 1982. Marr told Daily Mail in 2009, when I first turned up on his doorstep in 82, the connection was instant, Hmm. even though we were complete opposites. Besides your husband, who was the most instantly magical connection in your life? Um, My best friend, Shauna. We met at 14 in drama class, and then I put a Skittle in my nose, and I handed it to her to eat. And she ate it. And we're best friends to this day. Really? You still keep in touch to her? Dude, You're she's just, my best friend. She's the best friend. She's That's my best friend. Like, does she live around here? Or? No, I'm New York. Okay. Which fucking sucks. But we grew up in the valley together and she's my fucking ride or die, bro. Fuck yeah, dude. All right. According to scientific research, the Smiths are very popular among depressed people. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That was me as 15. A, a study found that the depressed related to and emphasized with Morrissey's lyrics, which tackle themes such as isolation, yes. social isolation, and loneliness. One person who was interviewed stated, the Smiths' music is like a pair of arms coming out of the music box yeah. and holding you. Morrissey Die. has been open about his own battle with depression, which he claims started in his early adolescence. During the saddest moments in your life, what are some of the lessons you learned about yourself? Oh, my fucking God. (laughs) The thing is, yes, thank God for Morrissey when I was 15 and super depressed because then you don't feel so alone. Uh, Thank God for Morrissey and the Smiths. But anyway, what I've learned is to have compassion for other people. I think when you're in the, the bottom of the bottom of the bottom... And you see somebody else who's nearing there or is there or has been there. You just have way more compassion. I forget there's some famous chef, like the original celebrity chef, that French guy. Do you know what I'm talking about? Fuck, I follow him on Wolfgang Instagram. Wolfgang Puck? No, no. He's a French guy. Anyway, he had something. Jean-Luc Good. Yeah, maybe, P- maybe. Picard? That's, no, that's, the, that's tra- Star that's Trek. Star Trek. <laughs> this guy, he said something like, to be a be- to have a bad childhood is the greatest injustice in the world, right? To suffer as a child, but it makes you a more compassionate adult and it sure. makes you a cre- it can make you a really creative, cool adult. So they're that, that, I would say, no, I, suffering. I c- completely agree with that. Yeah. If, if my life would have been, if my dad would have given me all the love that I needed, would I have worked this hard to get to where I am? Probably not. Yeah. You know, because it's like there's, you have to, I always look at this basketball player, John Wall, who's one of my favorite players, and it's like, dude, he had a tough life. So he's playing with a chip on his shoulder. Yeah. Nobody's believed in him, and he's just been pushed down, and he just keeps proving people wrong. Yeah. So uh, I get it. Can't I, be I completely get that, chef. All right, the cover photo is st- is a still of Joe D. Alessandro from Andy Warhol's 1968 film <laughs> Flesh. Didn't yep. know that. Joe time. was not only immortalized as Little Joe on Lou Reed's Walk in the Wild Side. No shit. Yep, but he was also a gay icon due to his work in underground films. He, Morris is gay. Gay, 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 which is fine. His underwear cover, his underwear covered crotch is also on the inner sleeve of the Rolling Stone album Sticky Fingers. This guy's got a famous dick. Yeah. In your career, have you ever been advised or coaxed into playing up your sexuality? All the time. A hundred times, all day, every day. Really? God damn it, not now, but when I was cuter and younger. I can't tell you ev- almost every fucking time somebody would be like, let me come watch you. Let me see. I had other women telling me, you know what you need to do? You have big tits. You got to show off your tits. You got to dress sexier on stage. You should wear high heels. You should dress prettier. Be prettier. You're pretty. You're pretty. You should be pretty. And I was like, you know what? Maybe that's good for somebody else. It's just not who I am. And it wasn't until I became older and became a mom that like I was freed of that. You know what I mean? Like, is it, you're not, you're no longer like the young, hot thing. 
Yeah. So it's good. It's so much better now that I'm like a woman and people no longer are like, you should be hot. I'm like, I, I don't want to. What do you say to them when they say it's that? It's not for me. It's not for me. It's not for me. Maybe it's for you. It's not for me. It yeah. never was. For me, it was about being funny and just being good at telling jokes. I can't do so it. even at the beginning? Yes. When you first started, you just never. Went, like you were totally against it? A hundred percent. When I first started, I dressed like a boy. I was dressing like Sarah Silverman because that was my, my, who I was looking up to at the time. Sarah never fucking tarted it up on stage. Not at all. But you know, not that, it, who, it, who cares? If it's your choice, do it. You know, if you can make it funny. It's hard to make it funny. I, I've, there's a there's a female comic that plays over sexuality a lot, and then she but then she also doubts it. Like she gets, she's mm. like, you know, but people like say all this shit, and I'm like, dude, if you're gonna do it, you gotta lean the fuck into it. If it's gonna work, if it's if gonna it work, works, do you, it. But you gotta own it. Yeah, you can't. You know, people are especially in comedy. It's like people are gonna say shit no matter what. For some reason, we, comedy like the audience that watch Oof. comedy feel like they can judge us and say shit. Last question. Here we go. Go ahead, mommy. All right. When the Smiths played a benefit for Artists Against Apartheid in Brixton Academy on December 12th, 1986, it would prove to be their last gig. Oh. The Smiths split up in 1987, after which all members pursued different musical projects. Despite several lucrative offers to reunite, both Morrissey and Marr have stated that they do not plan to play together ever again. Yes. All right. What gig or event made you contemplate giving up comedy? <laughs> so many. Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, the first time I ever featured on the road ever was on a triple run. Did you ever do oh, a triple run? I never did one, but I know all about it. So basically, there are a series of hell gigs. You drive five to six hours every day. They're usually in the Pacific Northwest. And they route you in biker bars. Hell, It's hell gig after hell gig, and you're in a car for two weeks. And I was featuring, and... It was like one of the gigs was like a Blues Brothers gig with like the chicken wire on the stage. Yeah. And do you know where it was? I want to say Medford. I'm not sure. Medford, Oregon. Oregon. Okay. I'm not. I that don't, sounds like a place that the triple run would be. Quote me. Yeah. yeah. We did do Medford was on the routing, but I'm not sure if it's, this is this room. Yeah. Any hoodles. Uh, I found out that this town we were in was a former clan town. And I knew this because I was talking to the chef who was like the one black guy in the whole place. And I was like, dude, what are you, you know, that's just a fucking white part of town. He goes, actually, this is a former clan town. I live 20 miles away. I go, oh, <laughs> weird. Okay. So I'm a new comic. I don't know how to do this, but I, my first opening line is, hey, what do you guys like to do for fun around here besides drag minorities behind your trucks? <laughs> Beer bottle flies right by. Really? Yeah. And um, and I get pulled off stage. And that was it. That was like your your build to do. And I was billed to do 30 minutes. I did about 30 seconds. <laughs> and uh, I was crying in the alleyway. I mean, that's one of many nights of stand-up where you go. I, I mean, look, I still have nights where you're just like, I'm the worst. I am the worst. I'm going to quit. Fuck this. I'm the best. I am the best. I yeah. do great work. <laughs> I'm so mediocre. I'm the worst. <laughs> You know, right? Doesn't it go? It's like yeah. perpetual. It could be any any hour of the day. It's yeah. Just, I could be like, oh, this I'm about to blow this, up. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. It's yeah. like yeah. it's just it's so yeah. back and forth. But yeah. Um, but no, we want you to stay because you're I'm so staying. Great. Please. I'm in, bro. I've you're, got no other options. You're so great. Thank, Thank you. you so, so much you. for coming by. Thank and, you for having and doing me. Doing this. Uh, yeah. What a good episode. What a good. Christina P., ladies and gentlemen, for all things Christina, go to her website, ChristinaPOnline.com. Follow her at Christina P. on Twitter and the Christina P. on the gram and Facebook. Don't forget, guys, check out her hour special, Mother Inferior, on Netflix. Also, watch her half hour on Netflix, The Degenerates. You can also see her live on Christina P's Ride or Die Tour 
May 10th and 11th in Tempe, Arizona, and June 20th through the 22nd in my hometown of Washington, D.C. Also, listen to her podcast. Your mom's house is phenomenal. Her and her husband, Tom, are hysterical comedians. Check it out on any platform. They just formed their own network. You can also hear Ryan Sickler's Honeydew podcast, which is taped out of your mom's house studios each week. So listen to the podcast, guys. I'm also going to be posting her mixtape track listing link. And for all things 500, go to the500podcast.com. That's where you find the mixtapes that every comic makes for you. That's where you find the blog. So if you guys want to have your word heard by all the rest of the Fleece Army, you got to send in your blog post, guys. Follow my writer, Morty, at DJ Morty Coyle on all social media. Also, check out him and his daughter singing songs in their car, and it's called B and Daddy Cartoons. It's on Instagram. It's adorable. Also, listen to his podcast, Yid Nation. Now, we just listened to The Smiths from 1984. Now, here's an artist that is directly influenced by this album. From Sweden and Minnesota, we have Flora Cash and their new song, They Own This Town. It's a great song, guys. And if you're in a band and we're directly influenced by one of these albums or artists that we are playing on the 500 and you want your song featured at the end of the 500, send your song to 500 podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you put the album and the artist that influenced you in the subject line. Send me your music. I'll play it. Just fucking be good. I'm trying to help people out. Send in your music. Next week is George Michael Week with his 1987 masterpiece, Faith. So y'all got some homework to do. King of Fleece is out. Stay fleecy, Fleece Army.